Cincinnati Reds baseball. Tonight, it's the Reds against the world champion New York Yankees. Hi, hello, welcome to spring training, everybody. Along with the crafty left-hander Chris Welch, I'm George Grant. A brand new year, 1999. A lot of changes on the Cincinnati Reds team. We can begin with the facial hair and the mustache. That's right, George. It took a 50 home run hitter in Greg Vaughn to get that policy changed. And, hey, he's not the only one sporting a little hair. We're going to see a bunch of them tonight. This is a Cincinnati Reds team that is different on the field as well as off the field and in the clubhouse. Greg Vaughn is the start of it, but there's some other key players that we'll be seeing tonight and the rest of this week. Oh, you're right, George. You know, every good ball club has a committee of players, veteran players. They govern themselves. And it's not just one guy that has to be the leader anymore. Barry Larkin is relieved at that. Vaughn is a leader. Harnish is a leader. Denny Nagel is a leader. There's a whole bunch of them up and down this clubhouse. Greg Vaughn's in the lineup tonight. So is Barry Larkin. You'll get a look at one of the new pitchers, too. Steve Avery will be joining us. He'll be your starting pitcher. We'll have the starting lineups when we return to Sarasota, Florida, after these messages. Welcome back to Ed Smith Stadium in Sarasota, Florida. George Grant with Chris Welch. You take a look at Jack McKeon, Don Gullett is pitching coach to his left, and Harry Dunlop, the third base coach of the Reds. That trio back reunited again for 1999. And so far this year, the Reds have been off and running to an outstanding spring. They are eight and five. The Yankees, on the other hand, coming in at five and eight. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the New York Yankees, the defending world champions from 1998. Starting anew in 1999. It's a lineup that will have some unfamiliar names to them, beginning with shortstop Alfonso Soriano. Derek Jeter will be back at uh, Tampa, will not make this trip today, but the Yankees will be playing the Reds later this week, and Jeter is expected to play in that game. Brian Robb is your second baseman. Chad Curtis bats third. He's your center fielder. Off to a great start this spring, hitting over 400. Shane Spencer, you remember him, came on, played a lot of left field, had an outstanding second half of the season, one of the highlights for the Yankees in the postseason, Shane Spencer. You know about Tino Martinez, the outstanding first baseman who took over for Don Mattingly. Uh, the left fielder will be Alonzo Powell. Scott Brocious, the World Series star, is at first. Joe Girardi, your catcher, and El Duque is your pitcher. For the Reds, here's Steve Avery. Chris, a uh, guy that the Reds are hoping will come back big time. Well, he's a guy that saw the Yankees plenty last year when he pitched for the Boston Red Sox. He could be a big story this year, and Don Gullett and Jack McKee and Jim Bowden obviously hope that he is. Hope that he can regain some of the velocity he had that back in 1991 when he won 18 games for the Atlanta Braves. Avery has gotten a little bit better each time out. This is his third time out there. First off, he was about 81 miles an hour, then got it up to 84, 85, even 86 miles an hour his last time out. So for Avery, it's as much as gaining his in velocity as it is spotting his fastball. He's always got that good changeup to fall back on, but he's got to set it up with something hard. Steve Avery is off his Atlanta career, was one of the star pitchers of the Braves during the early 1990s, has had arm difficulties and slowly but surely trying to get his arm speed and his strength built back up. Here's Alfonso Soriano who will lead it off against Avery. Soriano, this spring in at 240, whacks at the first pitch, pops it up down the left field line. Larkin calls off Aaron Boone and gloves it on this gusty night here in Sarasota, Florida. Here's Steve Avery, and what does his pitching coach, Don Gullett, think about it? What we're trying to do is get him back to where he was when he, again, when he was successful with Atlanta, and that's getting back on top and getting a little more body turn and uh, really building arm strength. I think uh, he's lost a tremendous amount of arm strength in trying new uh, new ways of, of pitching, and certainly, uh, you know, he's worked really, really hard all, all spring long. We've got him on a uh, basically a total rehab, uh, re-strengthening program in conjunction with doing the everyday uh, chores of spring training. And I see a lot better arm action. Arm strength is going to come, although I don't think we're going to necessarily see it as early as we'd like because uh, he's doing a tremendous amount of work that people can't see him doing and, uh, in, in conjunction with throwing. So uh, it's a lot of progress thus far, but he's got a ways to go, and he realizes that. Gullet on Avery, Eddie Taubman, see you saw him get turned around on that pop-up. All you have to do is look at the flags, and you'll see why he had difficulty tracking that one down. The wind, which usually blows in here at Ed Smith Stadium, you can get an idea where that's going. So you get the ball up in left and left center, it's going to get out of this ballpark pronto. But that's the breeze that blew the ball back. It looked like it was heading into the stand as it ended up. It fell harmlessly for a foul ball. This one will plunk into the right center and get by both Cameron and Dimitri Young. It'll be a two-base hit. The wind, which has been a factor the last couple of days, 
Yesterday, very breezy and rainy here in southwest Florida. And today, the rain has stopped, but the wind is gusting at times over 30 miles per hour. So Rob is on second with a wind-blown two-base hit. And here's Chad Curtis batting third in the Yankee lineup. The Yankees, of course, fresh off their 125 victory world championship season in 1998 have been rocked this spring, most notably with the prostate cancer news from Joe Torre. We talked to Don Zimmer, the Yankee manager, and while Torre is on the sidelines and the Yankee players today, Torre did address them before the trip to Sarasota today. He said he feels better. He's glad that finally he's in a situation where he knows that this is going to be taken care of. He'll have surgery in St. Louis. And Chris, what we can say is we send our prayers, our thoughts, and our best wishes to Joe Torre. Well, Jordan, very well said. You know, everybody wishes Joe Torre the best. He's a, he's a battler, though. And, uh, you know, like Don Zimmer told me before the ball game, if they tell Joe Torre it's going to be six to nine weeks, he'll be back before then, to be sure. We certainly uh, send our prayers and hope that that is the case. And speaking of get well wishes, we send uh, our love and our thoughts to Larry Barton, who is uh, recuperating today back in Cincinnati. Larry, uh, get yourself well and back with us soon. We miss you down here. Come on down and work on your tan a little bit, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Two balls and one strike for the number three hitter, Curtis, and he fouls it off. Let's take a quick peek at the Reds' defensive alignment for tonight. This is a pretty standard lineup through spring training. Tauvinsey behind the plate. Aaron Boone, Larkin. Pokey Reese taking over for Brett Boone at second. Casey at first. Dimitri Young in right. Cameron in center. And the big bat, Greg Vaughn, is over in left. Two, two. And Curtis will ask for time. If you were to break camp today, Chris, I think you'd probably have to say this is Jack McKeon's starting lineup. And he's gone with the same lineup a number of times already this spring. I think he'd like to get these guys playing together, get everybody to know each other awfully well because you have some changes from last year, obviously, and most notably, Pokey Reese to second base. But of course, the change of uh, Dimitri Young going from left field over to right field, that takes a little bit of uh, a different approach to things. So all that kind of work with your teammates is very important. Jack McKean wants to make sure these guys get to know each other. Doesn't play them all nine innings at a time, but certainly gets them a chance to play together early in the ballgame. Full count from Avery. And it's a call strike three as Avery punches out Curtis. But Curtis does not get the job done with less than two outs. Usually he's money in the bank to get the ball to the right side to get the runner over. Instead, he takes this call third strike. It's all about arm speed when you throw a changeup, and that is the Steve Avery changeup right there. He sets it up with a fastball, and he comes right with the same delivery on the changeup. A hitter like Curtis, who's very aggressive, just frozen on that arm action. And that's one of the things that Don Gullett likes the most about Steve Avery. Curtis, very valuable for the Yankees the last couple of years. Sometimes center fielder, and had they not re-signed Bernie Williams, the talk was that he'd get a chance to start on an everyday basis if, had they not been able to come up with another center fielder. But Bernie solved that problem and became a rich man by mm -hmm. re-signing with the Yankees. So Chad will be back playing some left. Daryl Strawberry back with the ball club again after his bout with cancer last year. He said he feels fine, and little by little, the strength is building up. But it'll be a platoon in left again, and Bernie Williams back in center, and Paul O'Neill, the former Red, will be in right when the season starts for the Yankees. Shane Spencer takes it up high for a ball. Two balls and no strikes for Spencer, who's 280 this spring, and I guess you talk about bursting on the scene, and Spencer did last year, but after playing a lot of dues in the minor league. Well, he's a guy that absolutely killed left-handed pitching last year. He was 465 against left-handers, right around the 200 mark against right-handers. A good argument for the platoon. Two and one, the cap to Shane Spencer. Spencer not only produced, but he handled the numbers and the pressure of the postseason by responding with those kinds of numbers. Over 400 with runners in scoring position. It seemed every time Joe Torre put him in the lineup, and that's one of the masterful traits of Joe Torre as a manager. He substituted, pinch hit, and did the things that needed to be done to help this Yankee team win 125 games in 1998. Sliced into right field. Cameron calling. Has it. That'll do it. So 
A base hit, a windblown double, and a runner left. We head to the bottom of the first in Sarasota. Welcome to spring training, everybody. The Reds are coming to bat. Let's take a look at the Cincinnati Reds 1999 starting lineup for this spring training game against the Reds. Mike Cameron over from the Chicago White Sox is your leadoff hitter and center fielder today. Barry Larkin in the number two spot. Sean Casey hits third. The big bat, Greg Vaughn over from the San Diego Padres where he hit 50 home runs last year as your cleanup hitter. Dimitri Young, the switch hitter, will hit behind him and play right. Eddie Taubin, see, your catcher bats behind Young. Then Aaron Boone, Brett Boone's brother, is over at third. Pokey Reese, the second baseman, who's alternated between first and eighth, will bat eighth today. And Avery, the pitcher, bats ninth. And here's El Duque. Orlando Hernandez, boy, he'll give you about as many looks out there as a Louis Tion. He comes from the side over the top. He's a, a very much of a credit to a pitcher that is not enamored with his own velocity, although he can get the fastball up over 90 miles an hour. Very, very tough against right-handers. His totals from 1998. You see how he burst on the scene in the second half. And this spring, Orlando's been effective as well. Remember this Yankee team from 1998 changed in one major respect. That is the addition of Roger Clemens. Clemens added to the mix in a trade that sent David Wells to Toronto, Homer Bush, and Graham Lloyd. So they get better. <laughs> and better. Yeah. One of the keys to the Reds in 1999, one of them is right here. Mike Cameron. They need him to play a speedy and fine defensive center field, and they need him to hammer down this leadoff spot. Swing and a miss there. Cameron's retired. Strikeout number one, and there's one away here in the bottom of the first. Don Zimmer, in the absence of Joe Torre, will be managing the club as long as Torre is out. And, Chris, you had a chance to talk to him before the game today. Oh, you know, he, he obviously feels very much for Don, or for, uh, for Joe Torre. He says this is Torre's ball club. He has been with Joe Torre since they took the helm four years ago when he disappeared in the fifth inning of the Colorado Rocky game. But uh, Zim is up and capable to the task, no doubt about it. And, of course, he's got quite a support staff out there in coaches. And if you just a regular lineup, and including the pitching staff that he throws out there, it's really almost hard to mess that up. We asked Zim about Torre. He came to the ballpark this morning, addressed the situation to the players, and uh, he's going to St. Louis Wednesday, and he's going to have the operation on Thursday. And people say probably between anywhere from three to six, seven, or eight weeks. Knowing Joe Torrey, and we're all hoping it'll be three weeks. Don Zimmer. And Chris, I know from Joe Torrey, I was with Joe Torrey in St. Louis, and uh, many people remember that the great St. Louis Hall of Famer Stan Musial had prostate cancer. So, so did Joe Garagiola, who's also from St. Louis. One ball and one strike to Larkin as El Duque delivers, drops down, and Larkin fouls it off. But Stan addressed the club, the Cardinals, back in 1991 and told everybody, make sure you get your PSA test each and every year. So Joe Torrey has been tested each and every year. It, this is not something that just came out of the blue. Torrey was one who... Um, heeded the call of Stan Musial after Musial uh, made it clear that the only way to prevent it is to have early detection. And we know here, even in our own Reds family, that early detection is very important with Joe Nuxall. No, no question about it. I mean, if you detect it early enough, the odds of you surviving and coming back very quickly are very, very good. Of course, like any cancer, if you wait too long, it can be very, very bad for you. So. Fortunately, Joe Torre right on top of things, the Yankee organization. I think you go up and down any Major League Baseball organization, that's one thing they have going for them. Everybody takes a physical every year, and they get tested thoroughly. Two balls, two strikes to the Reds' captain, Barry Larkin. When you last heard from Barry during the winter, of course, there was the early winter grumbling that he was unhappy when Brett Boone was traded. So it was just about everybody else in the Reds organization to lose a guy of Brett Boone's character and stature in the clubhouse as well as his baseball ability. It hurt everybody, but it hurt Larkin more than anyone else. They had grown so close both on the field and off the field. But that tune changed when Greg Vaughn was traded for, and the complexion, the offensive complexion of this team changed dramatically with the addition of Vaughn and Larkin, as well as the rest of the Reds. Chris, we've, uh, we've been together now since 1993 doing Reds games, and I think during the 
95 year, there was a lot of optimism because mm -hmm. this team felt they could go to the postseason and do well. This is the first time since 95 that that same feeling has been evident in this clubhouse, don't you think? You know what word has not been evident around the clubhouse? That R word that starts with rebuilding. You know, it's nice to say, hey, we're going to talk about wins. We're talking about competing. We're talking about actually winning the Central Division Championship, not necessarily about retooling. Hey, come out and look at this young player because we really think he's going to be something in two or three years. Uh -uh. You've got a bunch of guys now that are that are veterans that, are, that can produce and that are expected to produce. And I think this ball club ought to have a whole lot of reason to be optimistic because I think it's a solid club through and through. And you look at the offensive side of it. If Cameron continues to do what he's done in spring training over 300, you've got Barry Larkin, a silver bat winner at short, doing what he just did there. That's working a walk against Del Duque. That's only the second walk Hernandez has given up this spring. And you got Casey behind him, Sean Casey. At 364 coming in, and you look at his numbers from this year and last year. Last year, 272, but that 272 was bolstered by a post-All-Star figure of over 300. So he came on strong in the second half of the year. Dino Martinez holding Larkin on at first. Hit pretty good to left. Will the win get enough of this? No, sir. That one pulled down. Casey's retired. And Chris, that's the kind of uh, swing we've seen from Sean Casey. He'll take what's given him. You know, pitch him outside, he'll go that way. That's one thing the scouts have always said about Sean Casey. The reason he bats so well, as far as the batting average goes, he's not afraid to go the other way. The Reds would like to see him have a little bit more power. And that bat, even though even that ball didn't go very far, didn't even make it to the warning track, it sounded like it was hit very well. And I think Sean Casey will end up surprising a lot of people this year having a little bit more home run power than he did last year. Speaking of home run power, here's the man. 50 home runs from Greg Vaughn last year to go along with that 272 average. He's had ups and downs in his career. His first six year, he averaged a little over 20 home runs a year, had shoulder difficulties. Then when he first went to San Diego, traded from Milwaukee in the middle of a 41 home run season, he was ending up in a situation where he was platooned with Ricky Henderson. And finally, he got back starting again last year. And boy, did he take off. 50 home runs. Only 27 men have hit 50 or more in their in the annals of baseball in a single season. And he was one of the elite last year. You know about McGuire, 70, and Sosa, 66. Ken Griffey Jr., over 50, and so was Vaughn. And Chris, not only the numbers impress you, but his work ethic has impressed everybody in this Reds camp. You know, he's always had a good work ethic, but I think it wasn't until last year when he really trailed Tony Gwynn around, not only around the clubhouse, but around before the ball game, followed him around, did all the exercises that Gwynn did, hit off the batting tee, and he really learned a lot about himself in his hitting stroke. Skies this one to left. Alonzo Powell is under it, and he'll squeeze it for the final out of the inning. So the Reds get a base runner on the Larkin walk, but two fly balls end the inning, and it's no arms, no hits, and one left. Heading to the second in Sarasota. Pino will lead it off for the Yanks. Pino Martinez. Alonzo Powell and Scott Brocious, 5, 6, and 7 for the Yankees against Steve Avery. A double in the first, but stranded for the Yankees, and Avery goes to work here in the second. Tino's numbers in 88, very solid, over 20 home runs, and again, as it's almost money in the bank with Tino, over 110 RBIs every year, last year over 120. He's taken over for Don Mattingly. Mattingly always very solid at first, and Martinez has provided the same kind of quiet leadership Tino remarked before the game that, whoa, this is a belt to right. No one's going to get that. That's going to be gone. Tino Martinez, first home run of the spring. We talked about the win. And boy, that one took the jet plane right out of here. It's one nothing, New York. Well, Tino Martinez did that 44 times in 1997, did it only 24 times last year. But boy, he gets a whole bunch of this. And one of the things about being a change-up pitcher like Steve Avery is that sometimes you don't have the stuff to get the left-handers out, especially the good lefties. And boy, Martinez, when he gets it, he doesn't need the win. Alonzo Powell swings and misses for strike one. Take a look at the location as Martinez rounds the bases for that first home run for 
Steve Avery, one of the keys, obviously, for him, yes, he doesn't throw in the vicinity of the way he used to throw in the upper 80s, near 90 miles per hour. His location has to be down. He elevates a little bit, and he's in trouble, and that ball elevated, and Tino made him pay. Takes a little bit off, change up, and it's one ball and two strikes. What's the Reds pitching rotation as of this hour? Well, you know about the trade for Denny Nagel from the Braves, another former Braves. Nagel, it is hoped, will be the number one in the Reds' rotation. Right now, he is yet to pitch in the spring training game. He's thrown on the side twice after experiencing some tightness in the back of his left shoulder. He'll pitch in a simulated game Thursday, and then it's hoped that he'll pitch in his first spring training game sometime next week. So realistically, he's probably at least a couple of weeks into the season before he'll be back with the Reds. Well, you know, he told me before the ball game, George, that best case scenario, he'd be back probably the eighth day of the season, seventh or eighth day of the season. I think that's probably pushing it for him. The Reds will probably take him along a little bit slower than that. He'll miss probably at least two starts if everything goes well. Tried to sneak that fastball right by Tino Martino. out over the plate. Boy, I'll tell you what. He has really come through for the Yankees. Not only did Tino have a great year last year, but remember he did most of it in the second half with all the rumors that Mo Vaughn was leaving Boston and heading to Yankee Stadium. Everyone thought that Vaughn would end up there, and then when it wasn't Vaughn, it was someone else. But Tino very quietly continued to do his job. Talking about quietly doing his job, how about Scott Brocious? Big for the Yankees all year, even bigger during the World Series. An MVP kind of World Series for Scott Brocious. This spring, he's picked right up where he left off at the 400 mark. Line to left, ball on over. And there's two away. But back to the rotation. There's Tino. The rotation for the Reds right now, when Nagel is healthy, he'll be number one. Right now, you'd have to say it's Pete Harnish, number one. Then Brett Tomko, number two. Probably Jason Bure, number three. So without Nagel, you figure it's between Avery, Reyes, and Paris for that number four spot. You really don't have a fifth starter during April. Not till the last week of April do you need one. So everybody says, who are you going to be your five starters? For most of April, the Reds will only go with four. You're right. And a number of those guys have pitched very well down here. Dennis Reyes came into camp a little bit out of shape. But Steve Paris has had a much better spring this year than last year. And remember, there was a period of time last year that Steve Paris was the best pitcher on this ball club. I don't think he really gets enough credit for what he can do because he doesn't do anything very much outstanding. Not a great fastball, not an overpowering breaking ball or anything like that. Just a very workmanlike pitcher that can give you some innings. And I think that uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out between here and the end of the spring. Remember, it's about this time on in spring training that you begin to face more and more of the everyday lineups of all the different teams. And that's a much better gauge of how you are as far as a major league pitcher. This guy is an everyday guy, Joe Girardi, the catcher for the Yankees. Takes a 3-0 pitch for ball four. That's the first walk issued by Steve Avery. So Girardi is on, and El Duque will get a chance to swing the bat with the DH not being used here. El Duque will hit in the number nine spot in the order. Now, the other thing to remember is you start to think about who the Reds will go north with on their pitching staff. There is that, that word that's so critical at this time of the year, who has options left. And Dennis Reyes and Steve Paris still have options remaining, so if need be, they could be sent down to the minor league to Indianapolis for the Reds to start the season. Steve Avery does not, so the Reds would lose him unless they kept him on the roster. So the likelihood is that Avery would remain on this pitching staff to start the season. I think he'd have to be hurt not to join the Reds uh, north when they break camp out of Sarasota. How many pitchers will the Reds take north? The general consensus has been it will be 10. Could be as many as 12. El Duque gets a rip at that, and it's one and two. As this spring training goes along, and also we'll be back with you on Friday against the Boston Red Sox, Friday night, then Sunday afternoon against the Texas Rangers. We'll go down the roster for you little by little and try to give you an idea of who's here and who's likely to head north. Swing and a miss. El Duque's retired for Avery. That's his third strikeout. But the home run by Tino gives the Yankees a one to nothing lead. Can the Reds match it? Dimitri, Tomlinson, and Boone do up next. Speaking of welcome the folks back, boy, it's great to have used to be number 23. Now with Vaughn wearing 23, he's wearing 22. But it's great to have Hal Morris back. Al and Megan, part of the Reds family, is here in spring training, acquired in the offseason by the Reds. And, of course, they now have a brand-new baby girl, Grace, who is just a doll. 
talk about this red team why is their optimism why are they better on paper and one of the reasons is the bench with guys like Sweeney and Lewis and Branson and Morris Hammonds and Tucker Reminds you a little bit of the Reds of 95 that had a much stronger bench. You know, George, it used to be that the Reds bench would be filled with a lot of young players, you know, kind of putting their time in until they got a chance to play every day. But now you look up and down that bench, there's not one rookie really that's going to be on that bench. All these guys are veteran players who have been everyday players at one time or another, and they're just good professional hitters. It's, this is very encouraging to be able to go to the bench late in the ball game and send up a a Sweeney or a Hal Morris and really expect to get it going with a base hit. Yeah, yeah, Dimitri Young comes out for the first Eddie out of the Tobinsey. second inning. And here's Eddie Taubensy. Hal, important little growth. Yep. I know he can do better than that, though. That's probably only about two days' worth. Career 300 hitter. Most of his years with the Reds has hit over 300. The only two years he was under 300 was when he was injured, including two years ago when he injured his shoulder. Here's Taubensey. Here's your facial hair look for 1999. Eddie had one of his best offensive years last year. It was slowed in the second half with a nagging wrist injury. He took some time off, let it heal, but when he started to pick up a bat and swing again right after Christmas, the wrist still bothered him, so they went in and found that there was a torn ligament. He had surgery on the wrist, and they thought, well, he probably missed most of the spring training, but he was ready to go shortly after the gun, and he's ready to go now. So it appears at this juncture that Provency and Brian Johnson are your two most likely candidates to alternate behind the plate. Provency, a left-handed swinger. Brian Johnson, who last year was with San Francisco, the right-hand swinger, and that kind of puts Rick Fordyce on the bubble right now. Fordyce, right-handed hitter, outstanding defensive catcher, has been with the Reds the last couple of years. He is out of options, speaking of options, so the Reds really will have to make a deal for him or keep three catchers, which is very unlikely. They cannot send him to Indianapolis. They will lose him. They'd have to just release him. And he's been chopped around a little bit already by Jim Bowden, believe it, because Jim's been trying to make a deal for some of the, some or one of the excess outfielders the Reds have. And, of course, Brooke Fordyce in that mix as well. They got off broken bat. Here's Brochus. And there's two away. The third baseman, number 17. is retired. And when you look at this team, we have a view. You have a view at home, and fans all over Reds country have a view. What does Jack McKeon think of this 1999 Reds team? The addition, to, you know, of Vaughn. There's no question about what Vaughn, Sweeney, and Johnson do to our ball club. They, they bring a... Uh, a, a serious attitude, a winning attitude to our club, and that's got to help our young players. And Nagel and Avery uh, uh, help our young pitchers by having them focused on their job and showing them what it takes to be a consistent winner. So all those factors, uh, you know, have helped us this, um, this spring. Now we have to apply it on the field. Reds manager Jack McKeon beginning his 50th year in baseball. Started as a professional baseball. He started as a player in 1949 in the Pittsburgh organization. And he's loving every minute of it today, just as he did 50 years ago. Two balls and one strike to the Reds' third baseman, Aaron Boone. Fresh off three straight multi-hit games. So the Reds still have a Boone. Brett is gone. He's in Atlanta. Aaron is here, and there's another one, Matt, who signed with Detroit two years ago. Matt's having a great spring. Had a game-winning hit in a B game the day before yesterday. Aaron's had a good spring here. 433, a home run and six runs batted in after his 282 year last year. It's his job at third right now, huh? It's his job to lose mainly because he has shown some promise. Of course, you have two pretty adequate backups over there in Tim Lewis and Jeff Branson, but they're going to stay with Aaron Boone. They feel that in the long run, he is going to be able to deliver some power, play more than adequate defense, and uh, there he delivers a base hit. He's been spraying line drives over ballparks all over Florida this spring, and there's another. His average over 400. The Reds have a two-out base hit of run on. And here's Pokey Reese. Speaking of straight, he's hit in four straight. Pokey and Mike Cameron each have alternated in the leadoff spot. Pokey, at one point, was in a two-for-15 funk, but then caught fire, got the average up. 
And he and Cameron each have had their moments leading off. Right now, you'd have to say Cameron is the more likely to start the season in the leadoff spot. How's he done at second? All you can say, Chris, is wow. He's come up with great play after great play at second base. He really has. He's shown an awful lot of range out there. The one thing that he has not been able to do with anywhere near what Brett Boone could do is actually turn the double play at second base. The pivot is still not there the way he would eventually be. Girardi to Soriano and Boone is gunned down. So the Reds get another hit. Nothing to show for it. No one left on. Ron Oster has a word with Aaron Boone, and we're going to the third. Alfonso Soriano, the leadoff hitter, will lead it off for the Yankees. Steve Avery delivers a strike to Alfonso Soriano, who popped it short his first time up. The Yankees, obviously, you win 125 games, you don't lose anybody. You re-sign Bernie Williams, you sign Scott Brocious to a multi-year deal, and you get Roger Clemens. Yes, they are the favorites, and the American League East again. The question is who will provide the big challenges for the Yankees during the course of this 99 season? Probably themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they stay together and play with the same teamwork and dedication they, they did last year, there's no reason to think why they, why they can't be even better. But when you're a large market club like the Yankees, you're allowed to do things like sign Roger Clemens, but also sign a kid like this young man, Alfonso Soriano. Out of the Dominican Republic, he's a youngster, just 21 years old, but they signed him to a $3.1 million signing bonus over a four-year contract. I mean, how many ball clubs are going to take that kind of a chance on a youngster? They're very high on him, but he's only probably going to start in single A or double A this year. Two balls, two strikes to Soriano. The dollars of Major League Baseball still very much a factor of the haves and have-nots. The Reds, at the end of last year, had a payroll that was around $20 million. Jim Bowden, John Allen, and the ownership have upped that payroll to just about 30 million right now. Where does that compare to the Yankees? The Yankees and the Orioles will be over 80 million dollars this year. So even with the improved 10 million dollars, the Reds are still certainly way behind in the dollar rate. Another change up right there from Steve Avery, even though it was up and out of the strike zone, the aggressive hitting leadoff hitter chases it. Strikeout number four for Avery. And there's one away. Top something will be into the seats gives us a chance to remind you that this copyright telecast is presented by authority of the Cincinnati Reds, may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of the Cincinnati Reds or Fox Sports Ohio. You practiced that all winter, didn't you, George? I said it every morning. You know, when I said my prayers at night, I always started it with the <laughs> disclaimer just so that I wouldn't forget the baseball season. <laughs> Sure is good to be back with you again, work, Chris. Oh, it's great to see you. There's nothing like this. <laughs> Line towards the alley in against the wall. Vaughn will get it on one hop, but coming into second base will be Rob with a two-base hit. Second double for him. The first wind blown. This one a bullet. What kind of an outfielder is Greg Vaughn? No, he's not a gold glove outfielder, but he will, number one, usually handle what's in his vicinity. He is very smart in playing left field. Does not have a lot of speed, does not have a great arm, but he's learned with his limitations, especially his arm, to do the things to get the job done out there. He knocks 50 home runs this year. We will not be talking about his defense. That's one of the reasons why Mike Cameron is so critical in center field, to have some speed with Dimitri Young learning right and Vaughn and left, both limited defensively. The key is what can Cameron do in center? Here's Curtis, who struck out looking his first time up. To build a championship team, you need people like Chad Curtis, who are willing to take a bench role and not grumble about it and produce when called upon. And boy, he sure has for the Yankees over the last couple of years. Yeah, he was used a lot last year as a defensive replacement out in the outfield late in the ball game. This year he's being talked about a lot of trade rumors. He would start on a number of ball clubs but not on the Yankees. The Yankees had all kinds of options in the offseason. When the year ended I remember during the World Series talking to Bernie Williams and down deep in his heart 
I really believe that Bernie thought he'd be someplace else in 1999, but finally the two sides were able to come together on a multi-year deal. So all the work that the Yankees had done about bringing another center fielder, someone talked about bringing Brian Jordan there, others have talked about Rondell White, among those considered in trade. As it turned out, they all got short-circuited, and they had to keep Chad Curtis, because they, if they didn't have anyone else, they knew Curtis could give them a serviceable job in center. And will accept the duty of, of not playing every day. That's probably the biggest thing. You bring a superstar in there, and he starts to complain, and you erode the good chemistry that you've gone to build. 2-2. Off and Taubensee holds on, and Curtis strikes out for the second time. That's five punch outs for Steve Avery. Early in his career, he did it with higher velocity. Now he does it with cunning. I would never expect Steve Avery to get it back up there at 93, 94 miles an hour, but he can be effective as long as he hits his spots and get his fastball up around the mid 80s. He's one of those rare left handed pitchers who can live up and out of the strike zone almost like a Tom Browning used to be able to do just throw that high strike and those hitters just never able to get their top hand on top of it. One ball to Shane Spencer fly ball to center field his first time up five on the left sleeve of each of the Yankees of course in memory and in honor of one of the greatest baseball players ever, not just in the Yankee organization, but in all of baseball, the Yankee Clipper Joe DiMaggio. He passed away this month after a lengthy illness. And we spent the last couple of weeks, everyone saying, who is the next Joe DiMaggio? I don't think there'll ever be another Joe DiMaggio. Not just the way he played the game, but the aura that he took wherever he went, both on the field and off the field. Almost every place we've gone, every ballpark, and every group of writers and ballplayers and broadcasters that we've talked with the last couple of weeks, almost every day the discussion gets around to the Yankee Clipper and just how great was he and what did he mean to the game of baseball. Great. Of course, Joe DiMaggio played in an era where baseball players were pretty much afforded their privacy and their private lives. Beat writers who followed the team around, if they saw something that was wrong, they oftentimes did not report it. Now there are so many writers and media people that are following ball clubs in hopes of finding somebody doing something wrong so they can exploit it. And it's going to be very difficult. Uh oh, Vaughn back. That's way back, and that's going to be out of here. Gone home run for Shane Spencer. So the script very familiar already for the Yankees of 1999, off their 1998 performance. Shane Spencer. It's his first home run of the year, and both Spencer and Tino Martinez have found Ed Smith Stadium to their liking, each getting their first home runs of the new year. The first baseman, number two people, Tino Martinez. The two-run shot makes it three to nothing. And we talked about how Shane Spencer had just annihilated left-handed pitching last year to the tune of about 465. He gets a pitch up to his liking. You can work up right there to some of the hitters, but not certainly to Shane Spencer. You can see that good, quick, short stroke knocked it out of here by a long way. And here's Tino, who homered last inning to give the Yankees a one to nothing lead. And Chris, we talk about pitching up, and you can really see on the replay from the swing and a miss by Curtis to the contact by Spencer. Yeah, you pitch up, but you got to pitch up and up. That right. was just at the top of the strike zone, not above it, and Spencer made him play. And there are some guys you can do that to. Curtis, very aggressive at the plate. You can do that to him. He'll chase it. But Shane Spencer, much more controlled, especially with that short stroke up in the strike zone. I'll say they've got him listed at 211 pounds. I think he's going like about 230. These guys are just getting bigger and bigger every year. And I've not even seen Mark McGuire yet. John Cooper make him a pretty good tackle. Put it that way. <laughs> hey, how about Kentucky last night at Kansas game? One of the most exciting basketball games we've seen in a long time. Kentucky advances. So do the Yankees in this inning. Thanks to Shane Spencer. Two-run home run. Spencer and Martinez homers. It's 3 nothing. We're heading to the bottom of the third. Pokey Reese will lead it off for the Reds. Pokey Reese shows bunt. Takes the ball to lead it off. Bottom of the third inning. Reese was hit in four straight. Avery, and then the top of the order, Mike Cameron. When the Reds put together their best streak of 1998, number three was playing third base. And 
diving for a ball. He tore a ligament in his right thumb. His season was over. Provided the Reds with outstanding defense at third, and he's being called upon to do the same at second, filling in for the gold glove of Brett Boone. Slice to right. One away. Spencer hauls it in, and that'll bring up the pitcher, Steve Avery. The pitcher, number 33, Steve Avery. This is not exactly a Chamber of Commerce night in Sarasota, but this has been a Chamber of Commerce month. It's a little breezy, it's a little chilly. Of late, you really haven't needed a jacket or a sweater at night. It's been just beautiful, but that front that moved through with thunderstorms and tornado warnings yesterday has left a chilly day today. And while we don't have six or eight inches of snow the way some of the tri-state area does, there you can see they're bundled up pretty good here. Every swing and misses, and it's 0-2. It's been a great spring. Unlike last year when there was so much rain, thanks to El Nino, this has been a tremendous spring for everyone through the state of Florida from a baseball standpoint. Idea is come down here, get your work in. Really, weather shouldn't be a problem at all. And uh, weather's been good. The fans are beginning to come out more and more. In fact, this night tonight, George, expected to be a sellout. All the seats were sold prior to the ball game. This will be the first sellout the Reds will have as a home team since 1991. That was back when they were playing in Plant City. 7,500 seats here. They've been averaging over 3,000. The last time there was a sellout here was in 94. Last time the Reds had a sellout that 91 year was right after the World Championship of 90 in Plant City. Avery's punched out. Two away, and here's Cameron, who struck out swinging back in the first inning. El Duque is not your easy right-hander, that's for sure. Not only does he have some giddy-up on his fastball, he's got a good breaking ball, but your right-hander gives you that high leg kick from the windup, and all of a sudden the ball's right on you. He's got such a good feel of all those pitches. You can look at him out there, and he is just so smooth, whether he comes sidearm, whether he comes overhand, it doesn't really matter. He just has tremendous balance, even though he has that high leg kick. And when you're right-handed, boy, it takes every bit of nerve you can muster up just to stay in the batter's box when he drops down on you. And you talked about the money that Soriano got. Same thing with El Duque. Four-year contract last year after defecting from Cuba. And he signed through 2001. A multi-year deal. You know the story of how he and a couple of others wound up on, in Costa Rica. And the Yankees signed him to the big contract after defecting. Well, he gets the punch out here. Two strikeouts in the inning. That's a total of three strikeouts in the ball game. Cameron's punched out for the second time. We're heading to the fourth. Three-nothing Yankees, and Powell will lead it off. Alonzo Powell, Scott Brocious, Joe Girardi, six, seven, and eight for the Yankees. As we go to the fourth inning to face Steve Avery, his fourth inning of work. Yankees, three runs on four hits, two big blows. Home run from Tino Martinez to lead off the second, one nothing Yankees. Then after a double, a home run by Spencer made it three to nothing. Here's Powell who struck out looking back in the second, the one one. The normal Yankee lineup would have. Martinez at first, Chuck Knobloch at second, Derek Jeter at short, and Brocious at third. Here, Martinez and Brocious are your two regulars. Jorge Posada and Joe Girardi behind the plate. Girardi is here today. And of course, old friend Paul O'Neill, who we did not see tonight, but we probably will see when the Red Thursday night go up to Tampa to play the Yankees where they usually sell out every night to 10,000. A number of the Yankees have been stricken this spring with the, I guess the flu bug that's been going around the Tampa Bay area. Paul O'Neill, one of those, giving the night off. Those guys will be back and ready to go when the Reds go up there. Aaron Boone, and there's one away. And don't forget, as the season approaches, you can visit the advanced ticket window and get your ducats for the hottest first game of the season. Like the Cleveland Indians coming to town. And don't forget, Sammy Sosa, after 66 home runs last year, is back in town. And Mark McGuire and his 70 home runs come to town, too. The ticket window open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. The advanced ticket window located at the plaza level at Synergy Field. McGuire hit 70 last year. 
but he didn't hit any in Cincinnati. He has never hit a home run at Riverfront or Synergy Field in his career. He did hit one against the Reds. That was in St. Louis off Dennis Reyes. That was number 60. Scott Brocious, fly ball to left his first time up. Was last year a career year for Scott Brocious, or is it just the beginning of a blossoming of his career? The Yankees believe that it was the latter rather than the former, and they signed him to a multi-year deal. What is up the road, though, after signing him and signing Bernie Williams, Derek Jeter. Mariano Rivera, two big budget signings that the Yankees will have to deal with. Right down the pipe, Rochus doesn't like it, but gets the one at 80 turn, and there's two away. The catcher, number 25, but a seven strikeout for Steve Avery. When he wants to make the pitches that he has to make to get a strikeout, he's made very good ones. Rochus probably thought that one was downstairs. Remember the strike zone that the umpires are calling this year is essentially and technically the same strike zone that they should have been calling all along, but now that Major League Baseball is going to have them enforce it more to the letter of the rule book, which is the halfway point between the belt buckle and the top of the shoulders and the hollow at the bottom of the knees. The big question is if they raise the strike zone, as Sandy Alderson has dictated, if they raise it at the letters, will they raise it at the knees? That's what the pitchers don't want, right? Well, no, they haven't uh, changed the rule book definition at all. All they want to do is the umpires enforce it as it is written. But it's amazing, though, you talk to a lot of these Major League Baseball players, George, at least in the Reds Club, you ask them, do you know what the rule book says about what the strike zone is? <laughs> they say, well, not exactly. What is it? Armpits to the knees? That's what we used to play when we were kids, but it's not like that anymore. And the halfway point is really just about the letters. And that's the high pitch that has really been taken away from the pitchers over the years. As a pitcher, would you rather have the high pitch or the low pitch? I think that uh, you'd like to have both of them. <laughs> <laughs> and the corners, too. Uh, the pitchers union will continue to love you. You want those two-hour <laughs> games, don't you, George? <laughs> Girardi follows it off to it, too. Speaking of Steve Avery, talking to Joe Girardi before the game, and remember Girardi was in New York last year, and Avery was in Boston. I asked him his evaluation of Avery, and he said, after being in the National League and watching Avery with Atlanta, he said he just looked like he was completely fouled up mechanically. Well, he's gotten a different view of him tonight, and Avery punches out another. That's eight strikeouts for Steve Avery. Yes, he's given up two long balls, but he's punched out eight, pitched four strong innings. We're heading to the bottom of the fourth. The Reds trail it by three, and Barry Larkin goes to the bat rack. <laughs> That's, uh... Might be my Nitro series, isn't it? <laughs> Barry Larkin. You and Jesse Ventura. <laughs> Double action. A little popcorn, a little drink, and here comes Barry Larkin. Larkin walked his first time up. You look at the Reds lineup, and over the last couple of years, you say, who's your best number one hitter? Barry Larkin. Who's your best number two hitter? Barry Larkin. Who's your best number three hitter? Barry Larkin. Well, this year, Larkin will probably bounce back and forth between second and third, and Barry rifles that one into center for a base hit to lead off the fourth. The first base what a remarkable year 1998 Short. was for Barry Larkin. Remember, a year ago this week, he underwent neck surgery for that bulging disc, came back the second week of April, unbelievably, but was really just a shell of himself, but he knew... The club, weakened already by defections in the offseason, needed to have him out there. He hit under 200 the first month. Then from the from May, the first week in May on, he hit over 320. And finished again, winning his eighth Silver Slugger Award as the best offensive shortstop in the league. Here's Casey. Ball inside. Look at those numbers on Barry. That's all related to the neck problem that he had. And, of course, just the year before that, he had major Achilles tendon surgery. Was the Achilles better? Well, he stole 26 of 28 last year, led the major league in stolen base percentage at 90%. The Reds plan to run more this year with Cameron at the top of the order, Larkin, the likes of Michael Tucker, Steins off the bench. 
Hammond. 2-0. Casey drills it right center. It'll drop. Larkin around second. We'll head to third. It'll be first and third for Cincinnati. With quick hands. And the Reds have two arms. Boy, what a nice swing Sean Casey has. It's not like it does come naturally, yes, but boy, he works at it, too. You talk about the hands, George. Look at that flick of the wrist right at the point of contact. That's why he was able to pull that ball and find some spot, space there in left center, right center field. You see him stretching out. He's had a bit of a pull groin muscle, so he's kind of treated it gingerly, and the Reds have their best threat of the ball game. Back-to-back -back bullets from Larkin and Casey, and here's Vaughn, who just missed hitting one out in the first and a fly ball to left field. Vaughn at 333 coming into tonight with a home run and three runs batted in. Dimitri Young on deck as El Duque goes to the stretch. You know, I was making a point earlier, George, about Greg Vaughn, about how he followed Tony Gwynn around. And Gwynn really coached him into hitting a lot of soft toss and hitting off the tee over and over again before every ball game last year. And really what it enabled him to do was to hit more hanging pitches, more balls that were hung by pitchers were hit by Vaughn instead of him pulling off of it and fouling them straight back. And that will be the difference, of course, this year. A home run hitter like Vaughn makes his living on mistake pitches. Really bought into Tony Gwynn's video program too. He'll not only look at video of himself now, but he'll visualize when he was in a streak. He has a couple of tapes that just show him with base hit after base hit. The right field hit pretty good. This will score Larkin easily. Fly ball to Spencer, and it's a sacrifice fly for Greg Vaughn. That's what you want. Runs batted in, runs produced, and Vaughn sacrifice fly gets the Reds on the board. Three to one. Right fielder, As Larkin crosses the plate. Another good example of going to right field too. Something a couple of years ago he didn't do that much of. Here's Dimitri Young, ground ball to second, his first time up. build a team as the Reds are doing with people like Dimitri Young and Sean Casey you got something special there you're not going to find two more likable guys than these two young fine hitters that the Reds have wherever you go and wherever they've been people rave about it. flag down they'll get one at second and that's all they'll get fielder's choice two away And Dimitri's on at first for Eddie Tobinson. Boy, nice play by Brian Rabb. He's a six-year free agent the Yankees picked up. Really, probably has some insurance to the major leagues, but primarily to play in Columbus. But what a stop right there. That ball had base hit written all over it. Here's Tobinson. Popped up to third his first time up. With Aaron Boone on deck. Schedule for the Reds. Tonight it's the Yankees. Tomorrow they're at Detroit. Wednesday at Lakeland, Florida. Wednesday at Bradenton against the Pirates. And Thursday at Tampa against the Yankees. Loop towards center. Soriano got it. Well, you saw a flash of the kind of athletic brilliance that that young shortstop had. He tracked that one down and prevented the Reds from extending the Indians. But a couple of base hits and a sacrifice fly, and the Reds are on the board. It's three to one, New York, as we head to the fifth, and El Duque is due to lead it off. Michael Tucker in for Greg Vaughn. He'll play left field. Also for Cincinnati, a familiar face at shortstop, Jeff Branson, signed by the Reds in the offseason, trying to make this 1999 Reds edition, takes over for Larkin and Short. And here is a guy who's been one of the bright spots in the talk of the camp, Scott Williamson, young right-hander, on the mound. Boy, bright spot, especially if you're reading the readout of a radar gun. This guy has just absolutely lit it up down here. Jim Bowden, the first time he saw him pitch when he was throwing 98 miles an hour, came in and said, hey, we have solved our closer problem. Well, 
Well, that's true or not. Just look at the numbers. Eight strikeouts in five innings. Williamson, when he gets that fastball over, combined with a major league caliber breaking ball and an unbelievably tough fork ball, he can be awfully, awfully tough. The question for him is whether he can accept the role at age 21 and whether he can throw enough strikes to make himself effective. A strike to Torres, the pinch hitter, so El Duque's night is done. Right now in the Reds' bullpen, if you were to project the start of the season, you'd have a familiar ring to most of that bullpen. The closer's role being split with Gabe White and Danny Graves. Graves pitched yesterday. White will probably see for an inning a little bit later today. Stan Belinda is back after his battle with MS last year. He's back and in camp and pitching well. Scott Sullivan, John Hudak. And Williamson is the wild card. If he continues to impress, he may push himself onto this bullpen, onto this roster. Branson tracks it down, and he throws him out. There's one away. I guess, Chris, a lot of it will have to do with how many pitchers the Reds will keep. The talk has been most of the spring that they will keep only 10, which is short for a staff like the Reds have. I mean, if you have a one major closer, if you have a Trevor Hoffman or somebody like that, a Rob Nen, you know who your closer is. And Using if, two closers makes it more difficult. Right, it does. And if you have uh, four solid starters that you know can give you some innings out there, that also gives you the ability to break camp with only nine or ten pitchers. Used to be teams would break with nine. Then it went to ten. Then the Reds have even gone to eleven. I've had a 12-10 man pitching staff before. But you're right. It's Williamson actually pitching his way onto the staff. I think that... Uh, He's really going to have to just continue to outshine everybody else because it's so easy to send a guy back who has options, who needs a little bit of time. Remember, he's been a starter in the minor leagues, and they took a look at him this spring and said, you know what, he's got the demeanor, he's got the arm, let's make him a closer because that's one of the needs this ball club has. Maybe he can help with the Reds right here in 1999. All the scouts with their radar guns right behind home plate, you see them there all pointed at. In every ballpark we've gone to this spring, after Williamson throws, they're all writing down and shaking their heads saying he's got some giddy up you see reds general manager jim bowden right in the center of your screen in the sweater but you know the other part of it is if you have a young pitcher like that is it better to send him to indy and let him get into a groove as a closer there's reds gm jim bowden and his wife amy and the family he borrowed that sweater from marty i think they use the same sweater drawer i got you Here's the one, two. But he's got some giddy up on the fastball. And hey, you look at the job that this man did in the offseason, the Reds general manager. In fact, before the game today, Brian Cashman, the general manager of the Yankees, came over, shook hands with Jimmy, said, Congratulations. Congratulations on the great job you did in the offseason, getting this club in a position where it can contend. There's Brian Cashman in the middle of your screen with the Yankee hat on and he's getting a checkup on the radar gun every time Williamson deals. Take a look and see when he's ready to pitch. Now he's on the mound. He's just now starting his windup. Whoop, here we go. Stick him up. Base hit right field as Dimitri Young thinks about throwing the first and if it wasn't Soriano who got down the line pretty fast, he might have had a shot at him. Base hit for Soriano is one for three. That was wrong, George. When it's like you said, that you could send Williamson down in an option. You know, he's not even on the 40-man roster right now. So they would first have to make room on the 40-man roster and then, of course, uh, displace somebody else. And in the time that you're thinking about maybe making some trades and having some flexibility on that 40-man roster, that also works against a young man like Williamson. 23 years old. He's only six foot, 185 pounds, so he's not the intimidating type closer you'd expect to see out of a guy that throws 98 miles an hour. He just happens to be blessed with one of those one in a million arms. Glad that all of you that are watching back home tonight get a chance to see this young man because in all probability he won't be with the club when they break camp, but you're going to see him. Yes. Whether it's in the middle yeah, of this will. year or next year, you're going to see Scott Williamson. You know, I, my observations of Williamson so far is that he's a little bit more effective out of the stretch. Not from a velocity standpoint. They tell me he's a little bit slower, a couple miles an hour slower, but he's got a much more solid delivery out of the stretch. He has a tendency to really turn his body and get himself out of whack out of the full windup, boy. But when he gets to that stretch position, he is solid right there. Branson can't get it. It's in the left. Tucker comes up scooping, and it's first and third. 
Well, a base hit to right, a base hit to left, and they're two on with one out for Chad Curtis. Well, even if you're throwing mid-90s, you better find some location right there, and that pitch just ripped in the left field. A couple of hard shot balls in a row right there. Might be time for Scott to mix in a breaking ball. One great equalizer at this level is ability and speed. Yes, you can throw 95, 98, but the bottom line is people will hit 95, 98 if, unless you mix in a breaking ball or a changeup or two. Here's Curtis, struck out looking, struck out swinging against Avery. So Avery, four strong innings. He did give up the two home runs. He did strike out eight. He gave up a total of four hits. Pretty good outing for Avery. And I think it's indicative, Chris, of what he has to do. He can't make many mistakes at the velocity that he's at. No, but the fact that he had that many strikeouts and a number of those strikeouts came on changeups is encouraging because it shows that he's got good arm speed. Hitters will swing at the speed of the arm and not actually the ball itself. So setting it up is nice. You're going to make some mistakes if you're Steve Avery, but uh, he'll get better the more innings he gets in. Remember, he's relearning his delivery, trying to come back over the top after being switched to more of a sinker ball pitcher when he was up in Boston. Two down to third. There's the great equalizer, Koki Reese, the bullet of the arm. Hurdled over the runner, guns it to first, and Branson and Reese combined for the twin killing. Williamson will say thank you very much. Boom. Starts it. Casey ends it. And the inning is snuffed out. Red trail 3-1 as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Well, the new pitcher for the Yankees, Ramiro Mendoza. You see the numbers on him last year, 10-2. That includes a 6-1 record as a starter, 4-1 as a reliever. Really one of the unsung heroes for the Yankee ball club last year is he could be probably a number three starter on a great many staffs in the major leagues, but he'll probably look at middle relief again this year. Invaluable to the Yankees, and Joe Torre has stood by him. There have been a number of trade possibilities that have come up in recent years, and almost everybody wants Mendoza. And Torre has tried his best to keep him because of the numbers you just talked about, Chris, he's valuable out of the bullpen, valuable as a starter, very valuable on a staff in this day and age where very often you need people that are versatile and they're tough to find. You know, he's, he, like El Duque, has a very good feel out there. He's got a very good sinking fastball, but he can almost survive alone with that pitch, but he's learned to change up. He's got a nice little slider as well. Nice loosey-goosey action. Boy, the Yankees, they just keep coming at you with good pitching. Look at the tail on that pitch. That will eat up the knuckles of a right-hander if you hang in there. Pokey fly ball to right his first time up. 0 for 1 shows Bunt takes a strike, and it's 1 and 1. Michael Tucker in the ninth spot in the batting order is on deck. Tom Hallion barks out a strike. Your umpires tonight, Hallion behind the plate, Tim Welke over at third, and Mark Hirschbeck, National League umpire, down at first. Usually there are at least two major league umpires at spring training games, sometimes three, sometimes four, and they'll fill them in with amateur umpires as well. One and two. We'll be back on the air Friday night against the Boston Red Sox and Sunday afternoon against the Texas Rangers here from Ed Smith Stadium in Sarasota. A ground ball out and there's two away. So two ground balls from Mendoza and that is his usual way of operating. Two away and here's Tucker and you talk about the Reds outfield scenario right now. The starters are Dimitri Young in right, Cameron in center, Vaughn in left. Michael Tucker trying to push his way into that lineup. He believes he should start. He bounced back and forth from starting to the bench in Atlanta. It was a very valuable part of their run to the postseason last year. Jim Bowden really has been interested in him for the last four years. Tried to trade for him from Kansas City. He went with Keith Lockhart to Kansas City in the Jermaine Dye deal a couple of years ago. And 
Jim finally got him as part of the Nagel deal. Nagel, Tucker, and Rob Bell for Brett Boone, Mike Remlinger. Isn't it interesting that uh, Jim Bowden has been after Michael Tucker for many years, and if he had been able to get Tucker last year or the year before, Tucker would have been inserted right in the starting lineup right away. He finally gets Tucker, and he's the fourth outfielder. Swing and a miss. Mendoza gets Tucker. That's strikeout number one for Mendoza. One, two, three. The Reds go down in the fifth inning, heading to the sixth at Sarasota. Spencer, Martinez, and Powell. Spencer and Martinez each have a homer so far in this one. Ed Smith Stadium, first pitch swinging. Shane Spencer bounces to the new third baseman. A familiar face for the Reds. And Jim went around the Cincinnati area. Mark Lewis back with the Reds this spring after being in Philadelphia last year. Lewis takes over for Aaron Boone down at third, and he gobbles that one up for an assist. Right now, if you were to look at the Reds infield scenario, you'd have to say that it's down to Mark Lewis and Jeff Branson between the two of them as to who makes the final cut. That's if, again, you're thinking of 10 pitchers. Right. And the thing that works against Jeff Branson in that respect is the fact that the Reds already have a couple of left-handed hitters off the bench and Hal Morris and Mark Sweeney. So do you go for balance on the bench or do you, do you make your decision in some other way? In the infield, you've got Casey at first, Reese at second, Larkin at short, and Aaron Boone at third. You also have Hal Morris as your backup first baseman and sometime left fielder. You've got Lewis, Branson, and Ralph Milliard, the youngster that the Reds got from Florida then to the Mets in a trade this past year. Milliard it would be nice if they could get him to Indianapolis, but he's out of options too, so it's unlikely or it certainly is not easy for them to try to get him to in. But the biggest question will be who will be that extra infielder? And right now it appears that Mark Lewis is the likely one. And Jeff Branson is the man on the bubble right now, barring a trade or any right. other move. Now, George, correct me if I'm wrong. If a guy's out of options, you can get him down to Indianapolis by outright. But the problem is trying to get him back again. That's when you expose him to major league waivers. Somebody can right? pick him up off waivers. You have On the way back. But on the way down, he is outright. Right. Okay. Milliards played well. Yes, he has. Reds. Good defensive player. Totino hit by the pitch. Pinch runner for him down at first. And here's Alonzo Powell, the left fielder. Nick Johnson will pinch run for him down at first. And the guy in the bottom of your screen is a familiar fellow. Jose Cardinal. He always looks like he's cold. You know, even in the middle of the summer. He's got his <laughs> That's right. That could be Synergy Field in the middle of August. <laughs> what an enjoyable guy to be around. Speaking of native of Cuba, Jose. Part of the Reds family and will always be. <laughs> he coached with Joe Torre in St. Louis and went to New York with him. The third base coach for the Yankees. This is Chris Shambliss, another former Yankee player. And there's Shambliss, still trying to break in as a major league manager, and he's on the brink. Been interviewed most every winter for the last two or three years. Studious, hardworking, great asset to whatever staff he's been on. One ball, one strike to Powell. Powell going for the downs that time. Here's a guy that had an outstanding career in the Japanese League. Doubling up as a batting coach, Chris Shambliss is. Powell, 34 years old. Probably will start the season down in Columbus. Willie Randolph is a normal third base coach. Randolph stayed back tonight. Back in Tampa. One ball and two strikes. Hey, and I didn't realize Mickey Rivers was back with the club. He Nick came the quick with a solid kick. <laughs> That's right. He still <laughs> throws the same like he's got a chicken wing on his arm. <laughs> what a great character and great person. It's great to see him before the game. <laughs> you know, I can't think of Mickey Rivers without seeing Pete Rose about 20 feet from him playing on him in the 1976 <laughs> World Series. Yep. 77 World Series, I guess. Right down the third baseline. He really changed the whole complexion of the World Series. 
took everything right away from Mick the Quick. Chris Sabo did that in his day too. Try to intimidate the hitter. Mm -hmm. Protect your dentures. There goes the runner on the 3 2. It's a call strike and it's a strike him out, throw him out, double play. Covency comes up gunning. And Williamson, after the hit batter, gets out of it thanks to the double play ignited by Taubensee. So it ends up being a 1 2 3 6 to the bottom of six we go. Top of the order, Cameron due up. Jerome Walton in center field for the Yankees, trying to win a spot on a club. And Nick Johnson will stay at first. The only changes as Mike Cameron comes to the plate to lead off the bottom of the sixth. Cameron struck out twice against El Duque. Glad to see him go, but doesn't get any easier with Mendoza. Johnson retires Cameron, so Mike's 0 for 3 on the, the shortstop, number 41. And that'll bring up the Jeff shortstop, Branson. Jeff Branson. You know, George, we talked about Mike Cameron and Pokey Reese, the race to see who will be the leadoff hitter. One of the things working against both those guys is the fact that of the 30 Schedule A games the Reds have down here in Sarasota, 23 of them have been against or will be against American League ball clubs. So these guys really don't get the opportunity to size up National League pitching really in any way at all. With the exception of the Phillies and the Pittsburgh Pirates, there's nobody they play with any regularity that is in the National League. There's nobody they play, period. Phillies and Pirates are the only They're two the only National two, League they? teams yeah. that we play. And it's changed a lot, the landscape of Florida. The Reds, when they were in Plant City, would go north and play Houston. They'd go to Vero Beach often. and They'd take an overnight trip and yep. go over to Fort Lauderdale. But now, people don't like to travel, number one, meaning teams don't travel very mm -hmm. often. So the Reds in southwest Florida have the benefit of great weather, but very few National League teams. The Phillies are in Clearwater. They'll play them. The Pirates are just up the road a touch in Bradenton. They play them. But other than that, it's the Yankees, Toronto Blue Jays, Texas Rangers, Minnesota Twins, and Boston Red Sox. Steady diet of those American League teams. Three balls, two strikes to Jeff Branson. Great to see Jeff Branson back in a Reds clubhouse. Just a very positive guy drills it right center field towards the gap all the way to the wall Branson will have at least two they'll take a turn at second and will hold there Branson the last two years with the Cleveland Indians and you talk about rusting that's the way he felt he didn't get a chance to play very often but he's had a lot of opportunities this spring you know to stay sharp you have to play and that's exactly what he did in Cleveland he rushed it he sat there on the bench in the American League you don't see as many opportunities to pinch hit and double switches and so on but this guy is a very solid major league player hope the Reds can find a way to keep him on the ball club that's echoed throughout the Reds offices each day Al Moore steps into the on deck circle with the pitcher due up next in the fourth spot in the order as Casey steps into the batter's box Sean Fly ball to left, single to center. This is this part of the game where there, you'll see a distinct difference between the Reds of 99 and the Reds of 98. Last year when the Reds went to the bench late in a ball game, you were usually calling on young players, either rookies or second year players. Now you've got people like Hal Morris, Jeffrey Hammonds, Michael Tucker, Mark Sweeney, good professional hitters that can come off the bench. And a lot of those guys would have started for the Reds of 1999. Remember last year at this time, the Reds were touting Chris Steins and John Nunley as the players of the future that would take them through the millennium. Might be that neither of those guys even make this ball club. Steins, That's how much the Reds have improved themselves. Right now, you'd say Steins probably would. Nunley's on the bubble. Two balls, one strike to Sean Casey. We'll have any uh, eve of opening day trades as we did last year, the Sean Casey for Dave Berba deal. I doubt that. That was pretty dramatic. It sure was. Especially if you were Dave Berba or Mike Remlinger, who wound up being the opening day starter. I wouldn't put it past Jim Bowden to try to top that, though. 
I think it's pretty clear that the Reds will have one or two trades between now and then, but to have one of that magnitude, I, I, I doubt we'll see. It's almost as if they like the ball club the way they are right now. They have probably too many outfielders, one too many catchers, maybe an infielder extra. 3-2 to Casey. The look now would be for a need. And about the only major trade I think that we can really reflect on in the last few weeks were the rumors that the Reds might get Vina from Milwaukee to play second and be their leadoff hitter. That pretty much has gone by the boards now. Mm -hmm. That would be the only trade that has been talked about that would be major in terms of disrupting the eight starters on this ball club. Although but that doesn't appear to be likely. Vina is still being dangled out there, but uh -huh. the Cardinals are most interested. Indications are the Cardinals have given up on the Baerga, Carlos Baerga experiment. Apparently, Baerga has shown them not much in the way of defensive range down there. Interesting, you know, you look around this National League Central Division, George, almost by injury, the Reds ought to be one of the favorite teams. Moises Alou lost to the Houston Astros. The, uh, the Cardinals now have a problem with Renteria and Ray Langford out there. Both of them expected to miss opening day. Kerry Wood going down to the Chicago White uh, Chicago Cubs. You know, the other part of it too is the injury factor in those who were not signed. For instance, we all thought that well, the, the Astros did not sign Randy Johnson, but we thought this spring that they probably would sign Roger Clemens. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that, so they don't. They're not as strong. They lost Brad Ausmus in the trade to Detroit, who will certainly impact their pitching staff. His absence. Also, from a Cardinal standpoint, the Cardinals were not able to bring Todd Stottlemyre back. Right. Casey drills it to left center, going way back, 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 back. It is gone! How about that for left center field power, and it's a brand new ball game. Sean Casey put the touch on that one up into the wind tunnel. For Casey, his second home run of the spring, and we have a 3-3 tie. Casey, who looked horrible in her pitch earlier in the at bat, completely fooled on an off speed pitch by Mendoza. He goes right down and dirty to get that pitch on the outer part of the plate, gets it up in the jet stream. It may have been extra bases anyway, but that just helped to get out of the ballpark. Three runs, five hits for the Reds, three runs, six hits for the Yankees. He <laughs> likes every ounce of that. <laughs> now he'll want to talk about that for a while. Morris pinch hitting hits it to Soriano across the infield and there's your second out of the inning so Hal pinch hitting grounds out another look look at the location not a bad pitch at all right, look at the movement on that pitch by Mendoza but Casey right down there to get it that's a good way not to put pressure on the groin <laughs> Not going to slow him down, is it? Well, groin or no. <laughs> hey, he had a triple the other day. You weren't here. I forgot <laughs> to tell you. He's going to be talking about that for a year. <laughs> Here's he's, Dimitri. He's promised to double the stolen base output. One last year. <laughs> they could just get him on the back end of a couple of double steals. He's in there. <laughs> Line drive. Off Soriano's glove in the center. Dimitri takes a big turn. He's going to try for two. Here comes Walton. Not in time. Two days hit Dimitri Young. What else is new? Mr. Double of 1998 gets a two-bagger here in the spring of 99. Dimitri did it 48 times last year. This time Soriano gets up. Really should have that ball. That ought to probably go as an error because it's a routine play, but off the top of the glove. Hey, By the time Jerome Walton's able to get it back in there, hustling, Dimitri gets the second. Scored a hit, so the hits are even at six. So are the runs. Now a go-ahead run out at second base for Eddie Taubensee. Johnson, that'll do it, but the Reds do some damage. 
A double by Branson, a homer by Casey, and Sean has knotted this one up. We're tied at three, heading to the seventh at Sarasota. Pinch hitter Hal Morris stays in the game to play first. The only change in the field. There is a new pitcher for the Reds, and that is Scott Sullivan. Scott Sullivan, you see the numbers on Scott last year, 5-5, five and 5-21, five, five Ernie. He had 102 innings out of the bullpen last year, and that's a lot for a reliever. He went out there an awful lot, and people say, boy, what a terrible year Sullivan had. Look at his earned run average. Well, every pitching staff needs a guy like Sullivan to go out there and essentially suck up innings. He went out there and got in ball games where the Reds were getting blown out, and instead of using up the rest of your pitching staff, Sullivan went out there and awful tough to keep your earned run average down when that happens to you, but earned run average has been his bright spot so far this spring, seven shutout innings. Matt Brocious, the third baseman, will lead it off. Brocious fly ball to left and struck out looking. Joe Girardi will follow in the eighth spot. What a remarkable year Brocious had and what a tremendous postseason. Oh, boy. He wrote a career epitaph in just two weeks of baseball. One of those guys, Chris, that you root for, though. Always mm -hmm. been a class ball player and a hard worker, and it all came together for him last year. And he did it at the right time, his free agent year. You're right. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt that he's surrounded by a pretty good cast of characters over there. Good supporting staff will make a, a ball player give him the opportunity to excel the way Brocious did. You know, he's one of these guys that you... You, know, you scout and you you know that he can hurt you, but when you've got a lineup of a lot of other guys that can really sting you, Brocious can sneak up on you, and that's exactly what he did. Ball four, Scott takes a walk. Sullivan, his first pass from Joe Girardi will come to the plate. Pinch runner for Brocious. Clay Bellinger. First and third baseman will run for him. Probably going to play third, too. So Bellinger in for Brocious. Soon to be a household name. I'll ring that bell. Here's Girardi. You know, I'm all for tradition, George, but if the Yankees are going to bring the kind of team they brought down here to Sarasota, let's put some names on the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with as many guys as they've got in camp, they must have some triple-digit guys that are running around, huh? Well, the other part that's difficult with the Yankees, all the numbers that they have retired. All the good ones are retired, yeah, huh? right. I mean, uh, one through nine, only two is left. Everything else is retired. And a bundle more. What was your... Remember, you were 70... I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember your number now. <laughs> You're right. What was you, I'm trying, I, what was your I had a real good chance to make it the ball club. 67? 67. Yeah. <laughs> it was up around 70. It was a good year. Good offensive lineman number. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know your chances of making the ball club aren't too good. Two balls and one strike to Girardi. Kind of insurance for the Yankees. Posada, they expect to catch more this year, but Girardi happy to remain in New York and also help Jorge grow into his job as the Yankee catcher of the future. Bring good people. That's what Jim Bowden and Jack McKean have done, and that's what Joe Torre did, and Joe Girardi is one of those. Girardi very close with Don Zimmer, was Zimmer who told Torre, if you want a guy that can lead your pitching staff and be a positive influence on your club, go get Girardi, and he did. That was Torrey's first year in New York. Here's the 3-1. Fly ball right field. In tight was Dimitri. He won't get there. It's on the warning track. Girardi will have a two-base hit. It'll be second and third with no one out here in the seventh. Well, Dimitri Young, they've had him playing in tight all night long against 
a lot of these lighter hitting Yankees and Girardi burns him with this. He really does. Girardi's got to feel good about this. Look how far Dimitri's got to go. He's still not through the warning track. This ball would have just have one hop the warning track. So Dimitri playing very shallow in right field. He gets burned. Scott Sullivan's got a pitch out of a jam. So tie ball game 3-3. Three, three, top of the seventh. The Reds will keep the infield back with no one out. Loki Reese will take the out at first. Mendoza gets the ball. Far enough past the pitcher to get the run in, and it's a 4-3 lead for the Yankees. I was about to say, and I'm glad I didn't, that it would be an opportune time right now for Scott Sullivan to get a strikeout. Maybe back-to-back -back strikeouts with nobody out and a man on third base, but Mendoza puts the ball in play. That'll make Don Zimmer smile. Cincinnati native Don Zimmer running the ball club in the absence of Joe Torre. By the way, back home, he says, hi, Glenn Sample. He says, how's my boy Glenn doing? Still he's doing magic. He's doing great. <laughs> Infield in, runner at third. Soriano, one for three, single to right his last time up. With the pitcher up, I think Chris, Jack McKeon was thinking the same way you were thinking. If Sullivan could have gotten the strikeout of Mendoza, then he might have walked the runner to load the bases, set up a double play possibility. Now the Reds have to bring the infield in with a runner on third and one out. The tall, lanky right-hander got the job done, getting the ball to the right side. He's just checking out that thumb, though. <laughs> maybe he's put his hand into a nest of bees. Uh-oh. Uh, Dimitri will be there. Hold on. Look out. We told you about the win. You can see they gusted out towards right field just the last half inning or so was blowing towards left center. Now it's going towards right. And Dimitri almost got deep by him. Well, that time, Dimitri playing short, ready for the chip shot. You see the ball carrying just a little bit. A lot of question marks about whether Dimitri ought to be able to go over there and play an adequate right field. I think he, he should be able to. In fact, he's worked very hard with new coach Dave Collins and taking lots and lots of fly balls out there every morning. Remember that most outfielders, and including right fielders, really only have to throw the ball 120 feet. They've got to be very accurate to hit that cutoff man. Here's the second baseman, Rob. Collins has worked with Dimitri every single day. Even now that they're playing the regular games, he'll come in early, work with him, get fly balls to his left, ground balls to his left and right. And Collins has said that he's never had anyone who's worked harder than Dimitri Young. This is the kind of comment you'd expect to hear about mm -hmm. Dimitri. Boy, I tell you, Chris, we, we've both seen it. It's a tremendous coaching staff that the Reds have assembled down in the minor leagues. Dave Collins is with them now. You know Billy Dorn is still with the Reds, but Buddy Bell is back heading up the camp over in the minor league side. Sammy Ellis on the pitching side. Freddie Kendall, Jason Kendall's dad, came over from Detroit with Buddy helping the catchers along with Russ Nixon. Jimmy Hickman's still there, and a lot of the other former Reds players and coaches have been around the last few years, but the infusion of Buddy Bell and Sammy Ellis to head things up has been outstanding. And it's not the kind of change that you'll see the results of right away, but I think over the couple next couple of years, George, you're going to see a much more polished ball players coming up through the minor league. Guys that actually know how to lay a bunt down and do the fundamental part of baseball that it just seems like the minor leagues this year, and maybe just the feeling I get being over there, it has more direction now than it did over the last few years. One ball, two strikes, two outs. Girardi over at third. The first day of camp, Buddy Bell addressed all the minor leaguers, and I mean, he put it very succinctly. He said, look, look, look at all of us pointing to him and the other coaches. We've all done it. We've played at the major league level. Our time is done. What we want to do, the reason why we're here is we want you to make it where we were. We want you to be successful. So drain us of knowledge. Ask us questions. Don't be afraid to 
ask us to come out and spend extra time because we'll do it. So the message was given loud and clear. Hey, the other thing that I've seen different over there is there are a lots of big boys over yeah. there. I mean, know, they've got some large bodies. It looks like the Reds of the 70s. Yeah. You know, the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s when they had any Yankee camps, too. Yeah. Big, strong players. Here's the 3 2 with two outs. Yes, sir. He calls strike three. So Scott Sullivan has the walk come back to haunt him. A walk, a double, and then the ground out produces a run. But he strikes out the second baseman to end the inning. Yankees take the lead 4 3 to the bottom of the seventh. We go. It's just like being home. Mark Porter, our, one of our regular cameramen from Cincinnati, with us. As you can tell, he's dressed for the occasion. Good to have you, Marky. Did you bring your snow shovel with you there, Marky? <laughs> All right, this is a night for Marks. <laughs> There's our irregular cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> get the, did Mark get the hat from you? As a matter of fact, no. <laughs> it looks just like one I lost. <laughs> Bellinger will stay in the game to play third. Mendoza will stay in to pitch. Mark Lewis will lead it off for the Reds. As we go to the bottom of seven. I want to remind you, we'll be back on the air on Friday. Our second spring training game. The Red Sox will come up north from Fort Myers to play the Reds. We'll be on the air at 7 o'clock and then on Sunday the Texas Rangers come north. Here's your lineup. Monday, April the 5th San Francisco comes to Synergy opening day. Nice play. He flashes it. Soriano makes the play and there's one away. The second baseman, number three, Hokey Reese. Well, he goes a long way. Look where he starts off, kind of in the hole right there. And not bad at all. Here's Pokey. Reese, four-game hitting streak on the line. 0 for 2, fly ball to right, ground ball to second. Michael Tucker on deck. Not the story, though, behind Soriano when he was playing over in Japan. He retired at the age 21 in order to become a free agent and then be able to be signed by the Yankees. Of course, the Reds have signed a player out of the Dominican, Alejandro Cazada. Soriano again. How about it? You got a gun to go with it. And that was Alejandro Cazada. Now it's Alejandro Diaz. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> no wonder he had visa problems, but here's Soriano going the other way. He tried him to his left, now try him to his right. Boy, that is a gun. A highlight reel for Soriano on those two ground balls. Here's Tucker batting in the ninth spot in the order. Quesada, the story on Quesada, if you didn't hear it, he was the player that the Reds signed this month for over $1.5 million. Probably start at Chattanooga this year in Double A, but when he went to Japan, they used his father's name as his last name, Quesada, in the Dominican. He's known by his mother's last name, which is Diaz. So now he's no longer Quesada. Well, either way, he was the first player that was signed under the new agreement between the major leagues and the Japanese leagues over there, which essentially the Reds were able to have in a closed envelope bid, bid for his services. If they were to sign him, they would pay $400,000 to the team, plus the $1.5 million, uh, you've got a $2 million player on your hand. Tucker strikes out for the second time. He's 0 for 2. Soriano put on a clinic with the two defensive jams. We're heading to the eighth. Curtis will lead it off. It's a 4-3 lead. Rather, Walton, Jerome Walton, in for Curtis, will lead it off. Avery started four innings, four hits, three runs. Scott Williamson, two innings, two hits, no runs. Scott Sullivan gave up a run last inning. And here's John Hudek, the fourth Reds pitcher. Jerome Walton greets him with a base hit to center field. Numbers for John last year started with the Mets, came to the Reds in July in the Lenny Harris trade. That's his overall numbers with the Reds. Very impressive though. Four and two, 2.43 in 30 appearances with Cincinnati. He pitched very well and 
he's a major component of this bullpen for 99. Yeah, he's a pretty good piece of insurance out there in the event that Danny Graves and Gabe White, the lefty-righty combination down in the bullpen, don't cut it. He didn't get money, much in the way of save opportunities last year, but he's done it before. Certainly, it's nice to have somebody with some experience and a good fastball out there, and that's really John Hudek's bread and butter. That's the good old number one. Here's Shane Spence, who turned around a fastball and ripped it for a two-run home run in the third. That gave the Yankees a 3-0 lead following Tino Martinez's home run to lead off the second. Reds tied it at three with a run in the fourth and two in the sixth. Two in the sixth, thanks to Sean Casey's two-run home run. And then the fielder's choice run batted in for... Mendoza knocked in the go-ahead run in the seventh. So it's 4-3, Yankees over the Reds. Here in the top of the eighth inning. While we send our well wishes, of course, to Joe Torre and hope that he's back soon with the New York Yankees in his battle with prostate cancer, we send our best wishes again to Larry Barton and look forward to him rejoining the Red soon after his operation this week. We want to also send our condolences to Jay Hawk Owens and his family on the loss of his dad this week. Our sympathies and thoughts are with you, Jay Hawk and your mom. But he gets back. Walton was moving off the bag, but he just did get the hand in. By the way, we also want to say congratulations to Mike Mahady and Susan. They're down here in Florida. They're going to get married this week. Big Reds fans down for spring training. They decided to tie the knot. They'll do it on St. Patrick's Day here in the Southland. Before the game today, Charlie and Mary Stevens send their best to children and grandchildren back home. They're probably shoveling snow today. Their kids in that school today, did they? No school today for the most of the kids in northern Kentucky. They'll be back tomorrow. I'll tell you what, they miss any more school days. They're going to start. They're already eating into their summer vacation. They're going to start losing their spring break. So it sounds good not to have to catch that bus in the morning, guys. But you're in the home stretch. Get up there and get to work. <laughs> Easy for you to say. You're here. <laughs> Debbie's back there. Two balls, two strikes. Walton, who singled his on at first, and Shane Spencer, one for three, the two-run home run in the third, his first home run of the spring. Now, we talk about another left-hander in the Reds' bullpen. Without another left-hander, Budek becomes very important, and last year, left-handers hit under 200 against him, and without another left-hander, they really count on him to be able to get left-handers out. The Rudek very critical to this Reds bullpen makeup. Walton going, it's ball four, so base hit and a walk. Two on, no one out. Don't forget, it's Tri Health Senior Citizen Day at the ballpark on Wednesday, April 7th. Thanks to Tri Health fans 60 years and older, they purchased box and reserve seats for half price in advance of game day. See the Reds wrap up their opening series with San Francisco at 12:35 at Tri Health Senior Citizens Day. That's Wednesday, April the 7th. Dusty Baker and the Giants come into town to open things up. Something for all of us to look forward to, the opening of the season, the Finley Market Parade. By the way, John Allen, the Reds managing director, will join us this weekend. We'll talk about this spring with the Reds and also, of course, the push and the plans for the new ballpark. Outside. John's got a big meeting with uh, with some season ticket holders coming up surrounding the new stadium, is he not? March 16th, 7 o'clock at the Hyatt Regency Ballroom. That's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. John will be there. That's Wednesday. Bob betting on Wednesday, Thursday's. No, you're it's right. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. No, it's tomorrow, the 16th. 16th. I'll tomorrow. screw you up if you let Tomorrow me night. George. Tomorrow night. Wednesday, St. Patty's Day. That's right. So it's tomorrow night. At the Hyde Regency Ballroom, John and Bob Bettinghouse will talk about the goals and the plans for the new ballpark. Pat McCaffrey will be there to talk about season ticket plans. 
Mike Schuster is supposed to be there too. Who's the architect who's helping the Reds plan for the new ballpark? We've all had the chance to talk to the people with HOK as they continue to compile information as the Reds try to come up with the best possible ballpark. Schuster down here for about a week or so right before the games began. Well, he was like a kid on Christmas Day. I never saw anybody have more fun in spring training than Schuster did. Three balls, two strikes. While we're First baseman Nick Johnson. While we're giving our best wishes to everybody, we want to send out our condolences and sincere sympathies to the family of Eric Moore, who a young man who lost his life to brain cancer, and uh, they're having a big benefit for Eric this coming weekend on March the 20th. They got him. Great combination, Rudak to Branson. And that benefit which will be a buffet and a dance and an auction for the St. Jude Church Undercroft Saturday, March the 20th, 6.30 to midnight. There'll be golf clubs and collectibles. And the Bennett family, or the Moore family, had uh, very much in a way of medical expenses and all sorts of things surrounding this young man's illness that uh, everybody can pitch in and help out. That'd be appreciated. And the phone number, if you want to take it down, please. Dina Cook at 598-6152, 598-6152, Dina Cook, the Eric Moore Benefit Celebration. Back-to-back -back walks after the base hit, and even with the pickoff, there are still two on with one out now. As Powell comes to the plate, Alonzo tonight struck out, grounded out. And struck out. When John Hudek has had problems, very often they're of his own making with walks, and he's done it here. He pretty much uh, goes 110% on every pitch Hudek does. He winds up and plays old good old-fashioned Powder River baseball. Pokey Reese. They'll get one, and that's all. But the strong arm of Pokey Reese enable them still to get the force. First and third with two away. That was a nice play by Pokey. He goes way to his left right here, kind of turns awkwardly towards his throwing hand and goes to second base. We've seen Brett Boone make that play many times, turning the other way. But that's a pretty good range down there. I'll tell you what, you'll see him get to a whole lot of baseballs, both going up the middle and in that first base hole. Here's Bellinger, the third baseman, who walked his first time up. First and third, two outs. Top of the eighth, the Reds trail by one, and the Yankees threatening to put another on. Pokey Reese, you wouldn't categorize him or classify him as a typical second baseman. He has a shortstop arm, and that'll enable him to do things that most other second basemen can't do. He doesn't necessarily have to be as quick-footed around the bag, and that's more than anything what he's worried about, his footwork around the second base bag. But with his arm, he can just get airborne and still throw a runner out and complete a double play. 1-0 to Bellinger. Hey, you know, George, this is a very special day in Reds history to talk about it next thing. I'm going to ask you if you know what it is. 130 years ago, something very important to this organization happened. Think about it. Bernie Stowe was at his <laughs> first game. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bernie. <laughs> He's still going at it hard, isn't he? He sure is. <laughs> Bernie, Mark, Rick have this clubhouse humming this spring training. Up. Will it stay in play? Robinson gives chase, but it'll reach the seats. Now you think Bernie and the Stowe family are humming right now? You wait till they get on that first road trip and they take two or three of those sets of uniforms out there with four <laughs> different hats and try to figure out who wears what and when. You like the new unis and hats? I do like the new unis. Of course, we don't see them here tonight. These are the practice uniforms that you used to seeing last year. The only difference this year, I guess, you see the Reds with the, the black hat and the red lettering and the black shoes. The players like it. Oh, yeah. They do. 
course, they'd wear it even if they didn't like it. Two balls, two strikes. Lewis will go to Reese, and that'll do it. So Hudak, in spite of the base hit and two walks, finds a way to battle out of it. And the Reds will hold that one-run deficit. We're heading to the bottom of eight at Sarasota. The Reds trail by one. Top of the order, we resume on this date in Cincinnati Reds history. All right, Chris, let's go back to 1869. It was when the Red Stockings took the field for the first ever professional game. They beat Antioch 41 to 7. The average salary of a player that year, $950 for the Red Stockings. And the season record, they didn't have a bad year. 56 at 0, and they tied one. That's like meal money for one trip. Mike Cameron, center field, hit pretty well. Going back is home, and it's going to be gone. Mike Cameron ties this one up in the bottom of the eighth inning with his second home run of the spring. He'll get a big time greeting. Number 44 ties this one up, four to four. He matches the numbers on his back, and the Reds have made a new game out of this. Number two on the spring for Cameron. Cameron have a pretty good spring so far, batting over 300. That's not a bad pitch at all by Mendoza. He's been victimized on two low pitches, one home run by Sean Casey, that one to El Centro by Cameron. And it's nice to see Cameron go deep, too, because over in that White Sox camp, Paul Konerko is the talk of their spring training. In November, the Reds traded Canerco to the Chicago White Sox for Cameron. The Reds had made a decision that Branson, left field, here comes Walton, he's got it. They had made a decision that Sean Casey would be their first baseman and that the only position they felt Canerco could play in the National League would be first. They thought he really could not play third or left field. And one of the major needs they had for the new season was center field. So they thought it would help both clubs. And so far, it looks like it's doing just mm -hmm. that. Mike Cameron ties it up with a homer. Here's Mark Sweeney. He came over from San Diego with Greg Vaughn. He'll pinch hit. Two years ago, he led the major leagues in pinch hits with 22 last year man off the bench for Bruce Bochy and the San Diego Padres. The duplication for the Reds really at this stage of this roster is in the batter's box and on deck. Sweeney and Morris, each of them first baseman, left-handed off the bench. They secondarily can play an outfield position if needed. Any team would be happy to have one. And the Reds have two. Two balls, two strikes to Sweeney. Sweeney and Vaughn each have brought a tireless work ethic to the Reds camp this year. They're both one of the first ones to the park in the morning and one of the last to leave after extra batting practice late in the day. Fastball gets Sweeney. He's punched out. Strike out for Mendoza. It's the second out of the inning. This is Mendoza's fourth inning of work. Hernandez went four, allowed three hits and one run. bounces out and after the home run by Cameron Mendoza settles down but number 44 has knotted this one up Mike Cameron second home run of the spring first hit of the night ties it at four we're heading to the ninth want to remind you following the game tonight on Fox Sports News we'll have more on Joe Torre he addressed the Yankees before they left Tampa today there's been a firing in the NBA. Who got the ax today? And where is Dennis? And when's he coming back with the Lakers? That's all on Fox Sports News after the game. Here's Joe Girardi to lead it off against the new Reds pitcher, the fifth pitcher of the night for the Reds. It's Stan Belinda. Stan, 40 appearances last year. His season cut short because late in the year he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, went back home, 
rested all winter long, worked out, and actually came into shape this year, saying that he felt better in this spring training than he has in a long, long time. So certainly things were put into perspective in Sam's life last year after that diagnosis, but he has come back very strong and expects to be strong throughout the season. Veteran reliever, 32 years of age. 76 saves in his career. Last year, more of a setup role as he's been for the last couple of years with the Reds. His numbers from this spring. When he first started to have difficulties last year, it was a tingling in his leg. Chris Shambliss gets a low bridge and just does get out of the way of that one. Didn't know what the problem was, and they checked out a number of things, thinking it might be a nerve problem or something of that nature and finally after seeing local doctors in Cincinnati went to the Mayo Clinic and they did finally diagnose in September late September that he had the initial stages of multiple sclerosis. They told him to rest and take medication. He has to give himself an injection each day. He does. His wife Lori have dealt with the illness and the treatment of it like a real combo and Stan has come to spring with that kind of a fastball this year. Usually he starts slow, Chris. He's usually 83, 84 miles an hour, but he's ahead this year than of where he normally is. Yeah, usually sometimes during the spring, Stan will shut himself down because he has bicep tendonitis. You can almost set your watch by it. So this year he's not had that problem at all, throwing better. As a matter of fact, he really feels that his little outpitch to left-handers, which is an off-speed screwball type changeup, it's even gotten better and better. He's got more confidence in it. And of course, when you face a lot of right-handers, you won't see it as much. But he says, hey, expect something big out of me this year because I feel like I'm all there. Here's B.J. Wazgis, the pinch hitter catcher for the Yankees, who steps in with one away, hitting in the ninth spot in the order. Soriano, the young shortstop, is on deck. Ball on a strike. DJ's no tiny guy. Well, how much meal money do the Yankees give these guys? He's going to have to raise his average about 60 points just to hit his weight. Two balls and a strike for the pinch hitter. We're tied at four, top of nine. If you're looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, Dimitri Young, Eddie Taubensee, and Mark Lewis do up. For the Reds, Lewis at third, Branson at short, Reese at second, and Morris at first. Taubensee behind the plate. Michael Tuck is your left fielder. Mike Cameron, whose home run is tied it in center, and Dimitri Young in right. Big time souvenir. <laughs> Line towards the corner. Tucker long run. Can't get it. Wazgis rounds first and will chug into second with a two base hit. Well, Belinda gives up the double. There's the go ahead run in scoring position for Soriano. Wazgis gets a bunch of this one. Right down and dirty right there, a little bit above the knees and lines it down the left field line. Wazgis, not much speed out at second for Soriano. Soriano popped out, struck out, single to right, and fly ball to right. Boy, defensively, it looks like the Reds don't believe that Soriano is going to get anything that he can pull because the center fielder, Mike Cameron, pulled way around towards right center. In shallow right field is Dimitri Young, and almost down the left field line is Tucker. So he's, Soriano, that is, got a lot of space in left center if he can get it there. See how tight Dimitri is. Two and oh the count. Might have swung at ball three and it's two balls and one strike. 
great to see Gene Michael, the former Yankee shortstop, now a special advisor to George Steinbrenner at the ballpark today. He's scouting among a bevy of scouts that are here. The man they call Stick, one of the slickest fielders, is really excited about this young man, Soriano. One shortstop admiring another. Interesting in talking to Gene Michael before the ball game. You know, he was a high school and college teammate of the Dayton Daily News beat writer Hal McCoy. Mm -hmm. And Stick actually admitted tonight that Hal McCoy was a better hitter in high school than he was. There weren't many people on the planet that Stick was a better hitter than he admits <laughs> that too. <laughs> but boy, he could pick it. Hal couldn't field or run, that's all. <laughs> two two. Down to third, Lewis gobbles it up across to Morris. And there's your second out of the inning. There's the Dean, Hal Morris, with Jeff Horrigan as they confer in the press box. That kind of a night, chilly night. They got the windows closed tonight. What a bunch of whims. And right to the left of your screen, once again, a rejoining Cincinnati Reds coverage in 19... 99 is Chris Half. Great to have him back on the beat. Yeah, good to see Half there around. Here's the second baseman, Brian Robb. Double, double, single, strikeout. Three hit night for him, and he's got the go-ahead run sitting out at second base. Reds haven't been able to figure him out yet. Tobin Seal go out and talk to Belinda. Jerome Walton's on deck. Real tough chore for Walton to make this ball club. Former Red, of course, former Cub as well. Former Brave, he's been around. Yeah, but you know, in a situation like Jerome Walton, or even out of, a, say, a Jeff Branson, it almost behooves you, with the money that they're paying now in Major League Baseball, to go down, put your time in a minor league. Something will always change. You'll be an injury, a trade, opportunity will open up, and if you're playing hard down there, you're going to get your shot. Got it in on the hands, and Tucker should make the catch. Michael under it. He has it. And Belinda battles back after giving up the two base hit. Stan closes the door. We're going to the bottom of nine at Sarasota. The Reds have played comeback baseball and late inning victory ball all spring. Can they do it again for their ninth win? Stay with us. New pitcher for the New York Yankees, Jeff Nelson. Only the third of the night, the Yankees had Orlando Hernandez. He went for Romero Mendoza went for, and here's Jeff Nelson, the sidewinder that comes way down around Broadway, or down around Laredo, I should say. He only pitched in about 40 to 45 ball games last year. He was bothered with some back problems, but he's got a wicked slider. And if you're a right-handed hitter, you better hang in there because that ball breaks as much as any breaking ball in baseball. Wazgis stays in to catch, so Wazgis and Nelson the battery. Nick Johnson still down at first. Bellinger over at third. Soriano and Rob, the double play combination. Powell in left, Alonzo Powell, Jerome Walton in center. And Shane Spencer stays in right. For the Reds, Dimitri Young, the fifth batter in the order, will lead it off. A double in three at bats, one for three. Eddie Taubins, he will follow. And then Mark Lewis scheduled up. With the right hander on the mound, the Reds still have available the left handed swinging John Nunley off the bench. As it is, you've got Young, the switch hitter, Taubin, see the left hander, and then the right handed swinging Lewis. Breaking ball in there for a strike, says Tom Hallion. Gets and Nelson can't get together. You see the catcher back there. He dropped out about 15 different signs, and Nelson kept shaking him off. 
Either he's calling for something he doesn't have or he just can't see his fingers. <laughs> just wants to invent a pitch here. <laughs> throw that splitter. I don't throw it. <laughs> Jams him with the fastball. One ball, no balls, and two strikes to Dimitri Young. Remember back in late spring training when I was with the Yankees in the big league camp, I was throwing to Thurman Munson, and I began to shake him off. I wanted him to come back around. He gave me three signals, and finally said, he just kind of waved me on. And that was the last signal he gave me of the day. It didn't matter what I wanted to throw, he'd catch it. <laughs> didn't exactly do much for my ego. I said, boy, you don't even care about getting crossed up with me, huh? <laughs> Work. Tom Seaver tells the story that the first time Mark Field caught him. Here's another look at the strikeout of Dimitri Young. Nelson's first strikeout, the first batter that he faces. He got together with Hill and said, We'll get together. It was a one o'clock game. We'll get together at 12 o'clock, go over the hitters and go over what we're going to throw. Well, Seaver, you, you know, Chris was. Like clockwork, very oh, professional yeah. what he did. There was Don't no, be late. There was no Mark Hill at 12. There was no Mark Hill at 12:15. <laughs> uh, he came by at 12:30, and Seaver said, "Nah, if you're that smart, we don't really have to go over it." So the booter went back and sat his locker, and finally the game starts, and he walked up to him before the game and said, "Well, I understand we're not going to go over the hitters, but how about the signs?" He said, "I don't want any signs." Seaver went through the whole game without <laughs> sign. <laughs> he didn't really need him, though, did he? Hello. <laughs> it's nice to know what's coming when Tom Seaver's throwing. <laughs> no balls, two strikes to Taubensee. Nelson out on top for the first two hitters he faces. Fisted to short. Johnson scoops and there's two away. The Reds had planned in this ball game to use everybody they've used. They wanted to start with Avery and then go with all the relievers, Williamson, Sullivan, Hudek, and Belinda. They've done that. Gabe White might be ready to work in any. He'll probably go next, but we go extras and they may be making a call down to the the other building. Here's Lewis. Rouse the guys out of the dormitory. Bullpen this year once again will be under the exceptional tutelage of Tom Hume and there'll be a new bullpen catcher Donnie Scott will be on the road for the Reds. He was the field coordinator for the Reds last year. Great to have Scotty on the road. That's at least until June when the Gulf Coast League starts up and then he'll come down here and manage that ball club for the Reds right along the west coast of Florida. what these Reds hitters especially the right handers like Lewis don't feel too comfortable about hanging in there. Lewis's first move is to third base dugout. Nelson has had back problems. Battled back from them last year. And Joe Torrey and Mel Stottlemyre the pitching coach waited and waited. There was wondering whether he'd be able to come back and that breaking ball is one of the reasons why they were hoping he would come back. He's throwing a lot better this spring and has been healthy. They need him to be healthy this year, especially losing Graham Lloyd out of the bullpen. He had him bailing out on it. Just misses and it's three balls and two strikes. Watch Lewis. A little bit of bailing there. The front foot going towards the third base dugout. Awful tough to hang in there. Nelson, when you're up there right-handed, he gives you the impression that he starts his breaking ball somewhere behind your left ear. And you just hope he guessed, you guessed right, that it is a breaking ball. Stadium in Sarasota. Jerome Walton's doodled it off. 
Stan Belinda will work his second inning of work. If you just joined us, Steve Avery went four innings a lot. Four hits and three runs. He struck out eight, did pitch well, but got bitten by the long ball. Tino Martinez, first home run of the spring. The lead off the second made it one to nothing. New York. And then a two-run home run by Shane Spencer, also his first of the spring, made it three to nothing. Avery gave up those three runs. Scott Williamson went two innings, allowed two hits, no runs. Scott Sullivan, an inning, one hit, one run. John Hudek, an inning, one hit, no runs. Belinda pitched the ninth, a hit and no runs, and it's Belinda in the tenth inning. Jerome Walton will lead it off. Spencer is due to follow. And then Nick Johnson, the first baseman. Jerome single to lead off the eighth, was almost picked off first, went to second on a walk to Spencer, and then was picked off second. No balls, two strikes to Walton. Yankee outfield situation further complicated by Daryl Strawberry's health situation although he is back and with the club now we'll probably see him when we go up there on Thursday they hope he'll be ready for the start of the season if not he'll stay down for an extra week or two of spring training but you know economically George if they don't take him north with the start of the season it'll save the Yankees about eight hundred thousand dollars in revenue taxes he can't get there, and Walton is on with his second base hit. The Yankees obviously over the limit already. They're paying luxury taxes with their payroll way up there. And Two and a half million dollars that the straw man would make would add to that. Reese just can't get there, and Walton is on. Jerome is a stolen base threat. Will Don Zimmer get him moving? Spencer, fly ball out, first home run of the spring, a two-run shot in the third, grounded out and walked in his four plate appearances. Boy, just in watching Spencer at the plate, he's looking for something he can jerk. His front foot, his front hip, all moving a little bit towards the left side. That's why it's often seeing Belinda trying to keep that ball away from him, maybe get a ground ball. When you talk about Walton being a possible base dealer down there. One of the first conversations that Don Gullett had with the pitchers and catchers this year is they want to keep runners closer, want to give the catchers a better opportunity to throw somebody out. Last year, Eddie Taubin seemed among the lowest in the league in being able to throw runners out, and they attributed a lot of that to the fact that the pitchers simply weren't holding them on close enough. Two balls, no strikes. He got it again. He got that quick with the signs. <laughs> He's going to tell Willie Randolph, you can have this third base box back after tonight. <laughs> Audrey, if you're watching at home, he's all right. <laughs> Two and one. Outside, and it's three and one. People last year said, who is this young guy, Shane Spencer, who burst upon the scene, but it was not a quick trip to the top. He spent nine years in the minor leagues, had some 900 games of minor league baseball before he ever got the chance. And after shortening his swing and refining his offensive approach, he made last year count. Three one, the ascent Jerome. Well, he and Don Zimmer, you'd probably say yes. There he goes. All that avoids the double play. And certainly any chance for a force at second. So the five to three put out and sending Walton gets him to second. So now the go ahead runs at second with one out. For Nick Johnson. You're right about Shane Spencer. How about the eight home runs that Spencer hit last year in September? That set a franchise record. And three of those grand slams. You talk about the magic touch 
Joe Torre certainly has had it the last couple of years. Team whenever he put Spencer in, whether it was a pinch hit or to start a game, he delivered. And in the division series, a perfect example against Texas, he had two home runs after getting a start from Torrey. Whether it was Curtis or Spencer or Reigns, whoever he put in. There's Zim. And Zimmer has taken over for Joe Torre, and he himself is a little bit under the weather. Zimmer had arthroscopic surgery on his knee, making it a little more difficult for him to get around, but I'm sure it's not stopping him from getting to the track. Well, no. You know, he says he's on it all day long, and what they tell you to do is rehab it, yes, but rest it also. He says, hey, it doesn't heal as quick as it used to heal. But he's got some pressure on him to get this Yankee ball club ready. Walton's going to try for third, and he'll get there as he kicks away from Taubensy. That is that corkscrew changeup that Stan Belinda likes to throw to left-handers. That ball will come down and kind of move away from a left-hander, almost goes straight down as well. He likes to start it down, then it even goes down farther. Taubensy did it fundamentally correct, squared himself up. The ball just ricocheted the wrong way. Reds will have to bring the infield in with one out, two-one count. Walton off third. 4-4 four, four ball game in the 10th. And it counts even at 2-2. Two and two. You don't know whether that 3-1 pitch that Spencer went after, whether it was a hit and run or a steal, you have a feeling it was probably a steal. And what Zimmer might have been talking with Spencer about is, you know, you got a pitch there. If you think he's got the base stolen, you don't have to protect the run. If you think he's got it stolen, Zimmer had a Walton had a pretty good jump that time too. But that's Zimmer, always talking to him and always key strikeout right there. Man on third base, less than two outs, comes right in the kitchen and throws the fastball by Johnson. Now the infield can drop back with two away, and here's Powell. Strikeout, ground out, strikeout, ground out. Well, it was Nelson bailing out the right-hand batters, and now it's Belinda dropping down against Powell. Good job by Taubensy here with a couple of pitches in the dirt. That man on third base has to be blocked that pitch, and he's done it. off third. Now reminds you a little bit of Cecil Fielder, doesn't he? A while back. <laughs> Outside, three balls and one strike. the third baseman on deck. Line drive, center field. Base hit, Powell comes through, Walton scores. So the pass, the wild pitch, Allows Walton to go to third, and the single scores it. Cameron had no chance there, and the Yankees take the lead. 5-4 here in the 10th. After sneaking a fastball by him on a 3-1 count, came right back in there just about down Broadway. Tried to get that fastball by him again, and Powell lines it for the base hit that scores a run. Long night for Powell, but he makes it end with a smile. And an 0 for until the 10th, but the base hit gives the Yankees the lead. Ladies and gentlemen, running at first base, 
Carpenter will come in and run for Powell. Looking ahead to the bottom of the tenth, Pokey Reese due to lead it off. Michael Tucker and then Mike Cameron. Eight, nine, and one for the Reds. Based upon the Reds' current pitching rotation, unless there's Clement weather. It looks as if we'll probably see Jason Bure on Friday night against the Boston Red Sox. If you tune in and join us at 7 o'clock. And on Sunday, we'll be back here at Ed Smith Stadium against the Texas Rangers. Over 7,000 tonight, 7,225 at Sarasota to watch the Reds and the Yankees. Is that an official sellout? I don't know. It was a ticket sellout prior to the game all tickets were sold risk night tonight so the actual attendance 7225 they get about 7500 into the ballpark you can Colorado get the ballpark. Rocky sell out yeah it, the problem around here is the parking yep you getting out 500 parking spaces 7000 feet you better invest on one of these lots around here huh? hey if you'll man it <laughs> two balls, two strikes. To Bellinger. A walk and a ground out in his two at bats. Great facility here at Ed Smith Stadium in Sarasota. The Reds moved here last year from Plant City. Beyond the center field fence, clover leaf of fields for the Reds major league team in the early going, and now all the minor leaguers are there. Swing and a miss. Bellinger retired, but the damage done. A uh, base hit, a wild pitch, and a base hit by Powell. And it's a 5-4 lead for the Yankees. Pokey Reese goes to the bat rack, and the Reds rally in the bottom of 10. Stay with us. Bottom of 10 we go. Jeff Nelson will stay in for a second inning of work. He had a very effective ninth. Two strikeouts and a weak ground ball out for Nelson in the 10th. Pokey Reese will lead it off. Michael Tucker will follow batting in the ninth position. And then Mike Cameron at the top of the order. Bubba Carpenter stays in the ball game. Jerome Walton to left and Shane Spencer and right. Bellinger, Soriano, Rob Johnson across the infield three. and was just remains the catcher. Here's Pokey. Reese tonight. Fly ball out, ground ball out and robbed of a hit on a fine defensive play by Soriano at short. He's 0 for 3. Trying to stretch a four game hitting streak. from Nelson. Tomorrow the Reds head to Lakeland to play the Detroit Tigers. And there's a good probability that they'll get a chance to see Matt Boone, Brett and Aaron Boone's youngest brother. Matt has been called up a couple of times for B games and with the Reds coming to town likely that they may bring him up just to see his brother. He's been playing very well, hitting the tar out of the ball, and he'll be in the minor leagues for the Tigers this year, but he's had a very good spring so far. And he's right. almost as big as Aaron now. Yes, Remember he Little is. Matt? I'll tell you what, you can't call him Little Matt anymore. That could be able to see hook up with his dad, too, Bob Boone, the special assignment consultant for Jim Bowden over there in the central part of Florida, taking care of those teams. 
like the Tigers and the Atlanta Braves. Houston Astros filling out all the reports on those guys. So I'm sure Bob will be in attendance. One, two, fastball, and Pokey Reese is punched out. That's the third strikeout in four batters for Jeff Nelson. He's in midseason form. And they're all staying with Brett. Ray, Granddad Ray, and Patsy are in town, too. All staying at Brett and Susie Boone's home. Susie expecting their second child this spring. Here's Tucker. 0 for 2, two strikeouts for Michael. The numbers on Tucker for the spring, 250 with one home run and six runs batted in. Those six runs batted in going into tonight. Tie for the team lead with Aaron Boone and Eddie Taubensey. Last year, Michael 244, 13 home runs and 46 runs batted in for the Atlanta Braves. Had a big postseason home run. The balls and a strike. Cameron on deck. Does he hold? No, he doesn't. 2-2. Two, two. Tried to hold. Tom Howden said, uh-uh, you went around. The third time Tucker has been punched out, and also the third time he's asked Howden about the last strike. That might be the definition of the new strike zone right there, that midway point between the top of the shoulders and the top of the belt. That's right around the letters. That's something the hitters are going to have to get used to, and Howden rings up Tucker. That's about the clearest view mm -hmm. that you've seen of it tonight, for those of you sitting at home. If you didn't hear us earlier in our discussion about it, they have been on the advice of Sandy Alderson from the commissioner's office. They've instructed umpires to stretch that strike zone, the legal definition of it. Cameron's 0-2 in a hole. Umpires didn't take too kindly to the fact that they weren't exactly included in the discussion about it changing that strike zone. We'll see how that washes out. Cameron struck out twice, grounded out, homered in the eighth to tie the game at four, and he keeps this alive. Big turn for Cameron. Fielded cleanly, so he'll hold it first. Now two outs, Cameron on, good at bat for Mike Cameron, and here comes Branson. The decision now is Jack McKeon. Do you send Cameron, get him running to get him in the scoring position for Branson? Do you hit and run? Your options with two away now are limited, but the key is get Cameron in scoring position. Well, it was a good at bat for Cameron because he really shortened his stroke once he got behind in the count. What they wanted Cameron to do is put the ball in play. You almost have to run him right here to get that man to second base. He does not have a lead like he's going to go. Jack McKeon has told Cameron this spring, look, don't worry about getting thrown out. Don't worry about getting picked off. We want you to get in the mindset of running because it will be important for us to have you moving. Last year, Cameron stole 27 of 38. The year before, 23. They need him to steal 30 or more and get on base on a regular basis. He balks, so Cameron will go to second. So they don't need to steal him. No stop at all by Jeff Nelson out there. He threw two times over to Cameron at first base to chase him back and then dropped the slide step on him, but you still have to hesitate once you come to your set. He didn't do that. Tom Hallion picked it up right away. Let's take another look at it. After throwing over two times, you've got to come to a discernible stop. Good call by the umpire. Good try by Nelson, but didn't get away with it. So now great speed at second for the Reds. 
The tying run at second, and it's up to Branson. And if the Yankees have a weakness, that is a big if, is that they don't have a left-hander in the bullpen now with the, the disappearance of Graham Lloyd over the Toronto that can come in and get out a left-hander. That's why Jeff Nelson's performance in this spring is going to be very important, both to himself and the Yankee ball club. Not only has moved into the on-deck circle, the last remaining left-handed pinch hitter for the Reds if Branson keeps it alive. Branson's already in a two-strike hole. Does he jam him with another fastball? Wazgis and Nelson can't get together. They'll roll through the signs again. Nelson's walking off the mound, but Hallian peers right back at him and says, not so fast. He froze Branson with his pitch. Judge well, for yourself. Not bad location right here. Hard for us to tell right there where the edge of the plate is. Looked like it was a hair inside, but it had a little bit of that comeback motion on it. One ball, two strikes, two outs. Reds trail by one here in the 10th. Popped up. Is there room for the third baseman? Bellinger under it. He has it, and that'll do it. So Jeff Nelson comes on. He gives up a hit, but... Two very strong innings, two strikeouts in the ninth and two strikeouts in the tenth. And the Yankees in ten innings wrap this one up. For the Yankees, five runs, 11 hits and no errors. For the Reds, four runs, eight hits and no errors. The Cincinnati Reds will drop their season spring training record to eight and six. And the Yankees up there the to six and eight. Jeff Nelson the will get Yankees credit for runs, the victory. No the final the of the three no pitchers no for the New York Yankees. We'll be back to talk more about it and wrap it up from Sarasota, Florida after these messages.